Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, heart-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. I want to apologize. We are having audio problems. Something about the speaker output is messed up. So if it sounds really loud or really quiet, I'm working on it. Uh, The podcast always comes out pretty good afterwards, and we will solve this problem one way or the other. But uh, we wanted to let you know what was going on. It is Grok Talk. We are here every, almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11. This morning here a little early, uh, 8.30, because we're expecting Carly Fiorina on the program for a 10 or 15-minute interview at about 8.40. She's calling us, so it's sort of a an open invitation. And uh, hopefully, when are you going to put your headset on so we can talk? Because you're just over there talking to yourself. <laughs> there he goes. Hey there. Hey there. Are, yeah. like, are they that comfortable? Are the headsets so comfortable that you can't tell if you're wearing them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're quite comfortable. They're quite comfortable. Okay. Now, I'm talking to myself because that's what engineers do when things aren't working. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's because we woke everything up too soon, but uh, we're having all kinds of problems this morning. So Yeah, the uh, the, the, the video stream doesn't want to start, but you know what? We got to Did you turn the camera on? Uh, no, we don't even get as far as the program starting yet. Oh, okay. All right. So that's the problem there. All right. Well, we are recording an interview with Carly Freer in a, in a few minutes. Hopefully, uh, all things all things will be equal. All things be, being equal, if we don't get the live stream to work right, and uh, until she does call again, welcome to the show. Um, the uh, post program version, the podcast version, is available on Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeart, and of course on YouTube, UStream, and always at GraniteRock.com. We are as usual, brought to you by the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers, only because they allow us to use the space. They they don't endorse us or anything, but we uh, we pay for phone and internet, and they let us use a table, and, and here we are. So, uh, this week we have, joining us later after Carly, uh, Tim Wigley from the uh, Western Energy Alliance. We're going to talk about the recent EPA rules on the Clean Power Plan and its effect on energy. And we're also going to have Leon Rideout on, who is a New Hampshire House rep who has announced that he is running for the Senate, the state Senate, in District 1, I believe, uh, up there, up north. And uh, then Bill O'Brien, former Speaker Bill O'Brien, New Hampshire state rep, is going to join us in studio to have a discussion about the U.S. Senate race with Kelly Ayotte and uh, the need for a primary. And we're the big news this week was that they had a, a meeting. It was a secret meeting until somebody told the press oh, and oh, uh, oh, our oh. phone calls coming in. So let me just take Mike's phone off the air here and we'll uh, put this on addition so you can answer the call and we'll get on with our interview. We're yeah, just so waiting to... Uh, bring you in, so we're you all set? Okay. Yeah, we're all, we're all set. All right, here we go. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm well, thank Good. you. Good. Where are you calling us from today? I am in Franklin. Franklin. In the mayor's office in Franklin. Excellent. Well, welcome back to Grok Talk. We haven't had you on for a while. We wanted to get you back in on the show. Uh, have a little discussion about this presidential race thing that's going on. Um, we turn the, <laughs> you think we yeah, got one? You think we got one? Yeah, we got a crowd of people. Uh, we got the, the debates. We got undercard debates. We got all kinds of things going on. Lots of people want to talk about a lot of things. I want to start with the, um, the thing I always hear from people who aren't supporting you. Um, when they talk about you, and that's the whole 30,000 employees meme. And it occurred to me, you know, as a person who's actually had to take a business and uh, an operation as an executive and, and do something with it to make it survive and to, to be viable, that uh, you made hard choices. Now, I, I talk to a lot of Republicans, and they're all pretty much small government people. Um, isn't it a good thing that you're able to, you know, maybe cut something like, say, government? Well, sure. Uh, <laughs> look, I led HP during the worst technology recession in 25 years. And a lot of our strongest competitors went out of business altogether, taking every job with them. I saved 80,000 jobs and went on to grow to 160,000 jobs. But yes, leaders need to make tough calls in tough times. And honestly, to your point, government is too big. The only way we reduce the size of government is to 
not only know where our money is being spent, but we need to reduce the number of people who work for government. And I think one of the things that people are tired of is a lot of tough talk, but no action. Politicians talk. I have a track record of translating goals into results, and I think the American people want results now. One of your uh, suggestions in making government simpler uh, involves reducing the tax code and dealing with the yeah. IRS. Can you briefly explain that to our listeners, please? Well, look, we have a 73,000-page tax code today, and there have been 4,000 changes to the tax code since 2001. That level of complexity favors big, the powerful, the wealthy, the well-connected. It favors anyone who can hire the army of accountants and lawyers and lobbyists to dig through the tax code. But if you're a small business or you're a family, you're having a hard time understanding what the heck the tax code means for you anymore, and you're probably getting taken advantage of. One of the reasons this never happens, I mean, how long have Republicans been talking about tax reform? Kind of forever. But it just gets more and more complicated. So we need to get it down to a level that is so simple that it levels the playing field between the small and the powerless and the big and the powerful. Citizens can help me do this. I'm going to use technology to engage citizens in the process of government to put pressure on the political, on the politicians, because we know pressure works. Politicians respond to pressure. But simplicity is as important in tax reform as the rates. So my blueprint, honestly, is lower every rate, close every loophole. There may be one or two deductions that are worth putting back in. But we have so much complexity in a 73,000-page tax code. And by the way, what does that mean? It means we need tons of IRS agents. Do you know that we have more IRS agents today than we have FBI and CIA combined? Boy, is that broken. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's really broken. And I, I heard what you said three pages. You know, it always amuses me. Obamacare's over 2,000 pages. The British National Health Service, not that I'm a great fan of it, was 47 pages. And by the way, Obamacare, the legislation may be 2,000 pages, but then it's accompanied by thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of pages of additional regulation written by a set of nameless, faceless bureaucrats in HHS. We have become a nation of rules, not a nation of laws. Rules. Who are these rule makers? I don't care whether it's the HHS, the EPA, the FCC, the NLRB. These are not elected people. They're not accountable to anyone. They're just rolling out rules that are consistent with their liberal ideology. And it's one of the reasons we have to put Congress back in charge. I have said for a long time, not only do we need to pass the zero-based budgeting bill, but we need to pass the RAINS Act, which puts Congress back in charge and says you can't roll out regulations unless Congress acts on them. Would you actually favor closing a number of the agencies? I know you've indicated there's a huge amount of duplication, but just closing some and letting the states run their own affairs. Well, first of all, there are so many things where the federal government is doing things they shouldn't be doing at all. Uh, at the Department of Education, there are a set of things in HHS that we should be rolling to the state. However, I also believe that we need to start at a different place. We need to start with zero-based budgeting, which means that we look at every dollar in every agency. Because the truth is, there is massive amounts of reform necessary in every single agency. We should use the Constitution as our guide. What is it the federal government is actually supposed to be doing? But we don't know where our money is being spent anymore. And the reason government gets bigger and more expensive year after year for 40 years, under Republicans, by the way, as well, not just Democrats, is because we never talk about all the money. We just talk about the rate of increase over last year's money. And the reason the federal government spends more money every year but never has enough money to do the important things is because all the money is already spoken for. So we need to go down to the studs, if you will, and look at every single dollar. Because while there are agencies that certainly may literally be eliminated, there is no agency that is immune from fundamental reform top to bottom. What do you see right in the in the, immediately in the executive? You know, we've added all these czars and all this other garbage that goes on there. Where do you cut there? I mean, do you walk in on day one and say goodbye, czars? And... Oh, absolutely. And by the way, I also walk in on day one and roll back all of the rules that have been rolled out under the Obama administration. There is no legislative or constitutional authority for these rules. The National Labor Relations Board just decides 
on a purely partisan basis that it is going to change the relationship between franchisees and franchisors, a business model that has worked to create thousands and thousands of small businesses all across this country. It needs to be rolled back. The EPA's Clean Power Plan, the EPA's Waters of the U.S. Plan, those need to be rolled back. The FCC's uh, 400 pages of regulation over the Internet passed on a purely partisan basis by a bunch of bureaucrats, and the FCC needs to be rolled back. The executive order on immigration, I mean, there are a whole set of things that need to be rolled back. And who are czars? We don't need czars. Czars also are unaccountable, unelected bureaucrats. This is uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that that, uh, that you know we like to hear. Um, you know, it, and I'd be I think correct in assuming that since uh, all of these uh, regulations and the, uh, the the orders from the White House that uh, may have triggered some of them are in fact not uh, not. Uh, caused by legislation, they can be undone by executive order just the same way that they were created. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Super. Um, I do have a question for you um, in respect of, I think you're doing a pretty good job of defining yourself before they define you. Uh, what I've noticed is that your uh, standing in the polls seems to depend primarily on your debate visibility, which you've done a fantastic job at. Um uh, what else is the campaign doing to increase your your visibility level to uh, to ensure that everybody that needs to know about your message is getting it? Well, let me say first, with regard to polls, that you know, um, huh, polls are hardly reliable at this point. I mean, we've seen that in previous election cycles, but you all are also, I'm sure, familiar with what happened in Kentucky, where a poll was taken 24 hours before the election and was 17 points off. The only reason people are obsessing over national polls right now is it determines debate stage placement. And I will just note that I started my campaign on May 4th. I was 16 out of 16. In fact, polling companies didn't even ask my name because less than 4% of voters had ever heard my name. And now here I am on a debate stage with seven other candidates. No other candidate has the trajectory that I have had while I have been building my name ID. So what I have been doing, in addition to talking with folks like you, because you touch and influence so many people, and I'm grateful for the opportunity, getting on regional uh, media as well as national media, I go out and meet voters. I'm really grateful to the voters in New Hampshire because they took me seriously from the very first moment I started coming up here. It's one thing to appear on a television screen, and that's important. It's another thing to talk in a radio interview, that's important. But actually, a lot of voters need to look you in the eye. They need to shake your hand. They need to understand who you are. And we're going to continue to do all those things. And I'll just uh, remind uh, all of your listeners that polls don't win elections. Voters do. Voters have to vote. And getting out there and getting voters to understand who I am and what I will do and the fact that I have a track record, not just about of talking about things, I have a track record of getting the things I talk about done. And that's what we need in Washington now. Someone right, well, you can get okay. it done. I'm sorry. Uh, we're down to about a minute. Um, how do people reach you? What are your uh, social media tags and handles and things? And Well, go to Carly for president. Go to Carly for president. We got every handle there is out there. <laughs> We're easy to find, and um, I will look forward to staying in touch with both of you and with your listeners as well. Well, thanks so much and, for making and, time and, for us. And Skip wishes he could be here today, but he has to go uh, visit with his son, who's uh, as a vet. Uh, well, and, uh, then, then Skip is in the right place. Skip is it, my Skip, best. Skip is exactly in the right place. I'll catch up with the campaign at some point on the road in the next couple of weeks, try and do an in-person. Uh, otherwise, uh, keep up the great work, and we look forward to hearing more from you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Carly Fiorina. And uh, people are sending me messages, and I'm working on this audio problem. And guess what? After a complete reboot, we have you stream. I'll be on live stream for 9 o'clock. All right. Well, at least we'll have that going because I am still having – those of you who are struggling to listen on the Spreaker feed, or maybe you're not, you know, if you're not, send me a 
send me an email or uh, send me a message. Send me an email at uh, steve at graniterock.com and let me know what, what you're hearing. I am hearing some very loud, loud, loud output. And I'm having some trouble managing that output from my laptop. So it could be a laptop issue. It could be a software issue. It could be a hardware issue. But uh, uh, I'm having some loud music and some quiet voices. I had this problem last week. The uh, recorded version, of course, is fantastic. The podcast comes out great. And, of course, you can always listen to the podcast after the show uh, if need be. And, again, we are also rebroadcast on the rocknhcr.com at 1 o'clock on Mondays. And we encourage you to, uh, t- to give a listen then because you'll get, the, uh, you'll get the edited podcast version, which is the full show. Um, without the five minutes in the middle because they have their own little five minutes at the top of each hour where they do their news. So uh, always trying to accommodate everybody. Hopefully we'll get this resolved. Uh, coming up uh, in the next few months, I want to let you know that we will have a couple Saturdays where we will not be on the air uh, because we always take those days off. The, the Saturday after Thanksgiving and the Saturday after Christmas, we do not do a program. So we will either put up a uh, a a portion of a past program or we'll build a program out of segments from previous shows based on my uh, time and availability or uh, something else. We'll figure something out either way, but we won't be doing a live show uh, on either of those Saturdays. So right after Thanksgiving and right after Christmas, we will do a show right after New Year's be- just because of where New Year's falls. So that's our, our changes to uh, what's coming up in the months ahead. Uh, not so far ahead, a little bit later, uh, around 9.30, Tim Wigley from the Western Energy Alliance will be on the program. We're going to talk about the T, not the TPP. That's a different issue. We're going to talk about the uh, CPP, like all these acronyms and all messed up. So the uh, clean power plan recently from the EPA that 26 states attorney generals have filed lawsuit against uh, under the impression or the assumption that it is not within the EPA's power to actually create these force of law regulations. And of course, we've written about it extensively at graniterock.com. Senator Kelly Ayotte supported it, one of uh, the latest of many uh, exercises of supporter votes that, that really do go against what Republicans are supposed to stand for and defend. And uh, your headset's not turned up because you're over there fooling around. Go ahead. Yeah, I would just be happy if these so-called Republicans would do the little thing that Trump said when he signed the the, uh, the pledge. Support to the Republican Party and to the conservative principles for which it stands. Or put another way, read the darned platform, dummies. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We also will have uh, Leon Rideout, who is a New Hampshire rep. From way up north, uh, he's going to be running for the New Hampshire State Senate, and uh, and as I said, I believe it's District 1, and we'll have him on the program uh, by phone to talk about the race and the issues up there. And then Speaker Bill, former Speaker Bill O'Brien, William O'Brien, will be in the studio with us uh, in the last segment to talk about, well, Kelly Ayotte and the New Hampshire Senate race, the U.S. Senate race, and we may find some time to talk about some legislative priorities and some issues and some bills that are coming up in the next session, things that are going on. Why are you over there? Because uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I got everything turned on right oh, yet. Oh, because is, so, is it up over here? See, I love this technical stuff. We, uh, we're amateurs, man. We, yeah, uh, we are. We do, other, the, we do other stuff the rest of the week. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like Blair Witch Project with audio every week, so it's very shaky, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually have... Uh, one and a half channels of audio. Okay, that's good. One, I think the other channel's got more noise on. You got a little uh, bit of music here? Maybe they'll help you out. We'll see. A little background. Yeah, I can hear the background. Good. Uh, it's it's already live and recording, and now we have a picture of the room. And if I quickly click on this, yep, we got our editor-in-chief uh, right there. Producer schedule. Hey, thank, uh, special thanks to Mike, by the way, who did all the legwork on the Carly interview. Um, and, and, and all the other Groxers, because we all, you know, it gets to be Wednesday or Thursday, and I've got three or four people who haven't gotten back to me about whether or not their national or local guest is going to be available in a certain time slot. So I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to rotate these bots around and make room and figure out who's going to be here. And then kind of last minute sometimes, although Mike booked this a while back, uh, we end up just all of a sudden having everything come together. So... You know, there's a lot of work. It's not just walking into the room and, and sitting down and having conversations with people. No, uh, you know, and, I, and I want to thank the, the Fiorina campaign for being um, you know, willing to communicate with us. Anna Epstein, the uh, press secretary, uh, is, is willing to engage and, and 
converse and at least we get uh, that's true we've we, talked we, we, we've reached out to lots of campaigns and they just don't want to talk to us for some yeah, reason I, we're I, not worth their time or something you know? <laughs> some are some some aren't and uh, you know we will talk to anyone that's uh, that's willing to pick up the phone and call us uh, and, and if you're listening, we're pretty fair. We, we don't ask gotcha questions in the studio. That's that's the blog side. We're a little bit more aggressive right. over there. We're really interested in just having you share your thoughts with our listeners. Right. And, I'm just going to uh, pick this up for a second. And that little white thing that you see in the <laughs> middle of the picture is the flasher, which we, um, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Steve. Which we lovingly call Ed Lasky after someone who was caught for flashing at German UNH. German professor at UNH. Um, Oh yeah, and I forgot. Jane's going to come in and join us for yeah, uh, as, a, as a guest co-host. If if yeah, if you want or if you want your candidate to be on the show during one Maybe of our one. one of our free for all periods, call 603-715-9689 and Ed Lasky the Flasher will go off and we'll put you on. That's right. And uh, first segment is just going to be us talking about the WTFs of the week, which by the way. Though Excuse me, I didn't make a list up, but I'm sure we can come up with a couple on the fly. Well, well, there, there, there are plenty. Didn't uh, Jeb can fix it to start this week? Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's that's for one. Jeb uh, can fix it. Yes, he can. <laughs> really? yeah. man. The entire web had fun with that oh, one. What uh, a joke. Poor man. What a joke. Uh, what a joke. You know, I, I, I mean, I, and I do say that uh, you know, um, in in the right uh, intent. Poor man, he's a nice guy. He did a good job as governor. You know, we may not appreciate his some of his recent positions, but he did a good job as governor. He's a really nice guy, and he, he seems to be standing there saying, "Man, things are different since I was running for governor. Uh, what's happening to me?" Uh, well, that's just the way it is. This is a very unusual uh, season, and it's been brought about largely by the Republican leadership. Uh, which has caused a, a complete uproar and uprising in the uh, in, in the grassroots base. It's why Trump's doing so well. It's why Carson's uh, out there. Uh, it's why uh, Ted Cruz is riding high. Uh, you know why Carly Fiorina is uh, is well up there in the same uh, general range of the polls, and why the establishment picks are dropping one by one. You know, Jeb's not making much traction. Walker fell out. Perry, uh, sorry for him because he was a good guy, fell out. Um, you know, and uh, and Kasich isn't doing as well as the establishment would like him to be doing. Uh, I, I got a great segment off of the Journal editorial report uh, last weekend where they were discussing his debate performance where he gets on stage and he's all angry about your 10%, 10, 10% tax. How can you run the government on that? You guys have no clue. You need an experienced How professional. How can you run the government on that? That's too much. Yes. What are you talking uh, about? He, 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 yeah, exactly. And, and, and so they analyzed him and, and uh, you know, figured that was a deliberate ploy and then said, you know, his basic problem is not only can a low flat tax work if it's structured right, uh, but but also, you know, he goes he goes and touts his experience as a conservative who can get things done, and then how then he lays out his liberal uh, policies and the cust- you know how, how are the voters supposed to know what they're getting. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah, I think that the Republicans. Are, I don't believe that he's going to catch much traction, even though the establishment's going to probably be pushing him and Rubio. But well, I think he's going to go to the wayside soon. I, I think he's, yeah, he's he's basically got one supporter, the Sununu family, who mm. I think picked. Did not pick wisely, so you know. Correct. Uh, John H is saying he doesn't understand the electorate anymore. Uh, no, it's just <laughs> the electorate's not listening to you anymore, sir. Uh, you know they uh, they've got fed up of people that go to Washington uh, that you and they promise will fix things, and they don't. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kasich, um, I'm going to cut you off because we're going to go into our next segment. May or may not have fixed uh, Ohio, but he doesn't look promising for the country. All right, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Oh, feel the power. Oh, I can feel it. Our moment of triumph approaches. <laughs> it's Rock Talk. Coming up today on Grok Talk, we welcome presidential candidate Carly Fiorina back to the program. We've also got Tim Wigley from the Western Energy Alliance on energy and the EPA's clean power plan. New Hampshire Rep. Leon Rideout joins us to talk about his race for the New Hampshire State Senate. And former New Hampshire House Speaker and current New Hampshire Rep. Bill O'Brien has some thoughts to share about the 2016 U.S. Senate race as well as the upcoming legislative session. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. 
the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW New Hampshire Family Radio and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Rock Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrock.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrock.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, The Rock NHCR.com. Rock Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Rock Talk. Former New Hampshire House Speaker Bill O'Brien called a meeting of conservative House members and activists this past Wednesday night to discuss finding a candidate to mount a campaign to replace Kelly Ayotte with a conservative Republican. The focus of the meeting, which was supposed to be kept secret but was leaked to the press, was to try and identify a single conservative candidate to challenge Ayotte in a primary. Readers of GraniteGrock.com will be familiar with our chronicling of her descent from first-year Tea Party senator to rhino stooge. This decline in principles has seen Ayotte support moderate and even liberal policy legislation on immigration, energy, taxes, and spending. Former New Hampshire House Speaker Bill O'Brien will be on this program later this morning to discuss the need to primary Senator Ayotte and to update us on the progress, if any, in identifying a candidate to do just that. Manchester held elections last Tuesday, and we'd like to congratulate our friend and occasional guest, Rich Gerard. Rich ran for and won a seat on the Manchester Board of School Committee. But the big race was for mayor. Mayor Ted Gatsis won his re-election bid as well, but only by 85 votes. Democrat challenger Joyce Craig has asked for a recount in what turned out to be a very high turnout election. We can't help but wonder if Craig lost because of earlier efforts by folks like Rich Gerard, Ed Nail, and to some degree GraniteRock.com, who pursued and reported on nests of out-of-state voters cluttering up Manchester's voter checklist. These pursuits prompted Manchester City Clerk Matt Norman to verify thousands of eligible voters in the city, and mo- a move that resulted in the removal of pages of current and former Democrat campaign operatives or their fellow travelers, listed as living and registered in the city, but who had long since moved on to mess with other people's elections in other states. New Hampshire native Chris Reagan of Hampton will be a moderator in the first of two GOP debates Tuesday, this according to Doug Alden reporting for the New Hampshire Union Leader. Growing up in New Hampshire, the paper reports, Trish Reagan learned early how seriously Granite Staters take their role in the presidential campaign process. Next week, Reagan will become part of that process as a moderator in the first of two debates with candidates vying for the Republican nomination. It's a tremendous honor, Reagan said Friday. I'm very excited to play a role in this con- conversation about the fiscal future of our country. Reagan, host of the Intelligence Report on Fox Business Network, is one of three hosts for the 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time debate Tuesday, which features four candidates who did not make the cut for the Fox Wall Street Journal primetime debate to follow. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of CNHT, GraniteRock.com, this station, or anyone else for that matter. In accordance with Title 17 U.S.C. Section 107, some of the material in this program is used under the fair use provision of federal copyright law. Sound effects were either created by the producers of the program, found free in the public domain, or are covered under Attribution 3.0. Most of the music on this program comes courtesy of Creative Commons licensing from Kevin McLeod at Incomatech.com. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House, this is Rock Talk. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Welcome to Saturday, November 7th. 
2015. This is Grok Talk. I am Steve McDonald here with Mike Rogers, and Jane Cormier has joined us as our special guest co-host. We've already had Carly on the program. Uh, we started early just so we could get her in, and uh, if you missed that, you can catch it on the podcast at uh, such diverse places as Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, and iHeartRadio. You can also hear it on YouTube and you stream for a little while and it is going to be and always forever as long as there is a granitrock.com on granitrock.com we'd like to welcome you to the show uh, our next guest will be tim wigley from the western energy alliance he's going to be on at 9 30 by phone after that we have leon rideout who is running for the new hampshire state senate and then bill o'brien i think you've probably heard of bill o'brien he's going to come in and talk to us about uh, the not so secret meeting from wednesday <laughs> and uh some thoughts about the u.s senate race at kelly ayotte and uh, some other things we'll, right. we'll manage to squeeze in here yeah. and there and one interesting thing that we learned uh this week uh, we know that the Democrats uh, fundraise off of Bill O'Brien's name because if you can find a good Republican to demonize, you can pull in the bucks. Yeah. What we learned was that Bill O'Brien has higher name recognition among Democrats than among Republicans because they spent so much time bashing him. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Yeah. How bizarre. Uh, but that's okay. You know what? We're not going to get that vote anyway. I don't know why that even comes up in discussion. Mm-hmm. We're not fighting for that vote. They're no. never going to vote for us. No. Uh, oh, and you ma- you made a mention during the newsread about Trish. Is it Regan or Reagan? Uh, Regan. Regan. Trish yeah. Regan. Okay, Trish Regan, who is going to be hosting, co-hosting a debate this evening. Yes. And you had something else to yes, add. Yes, when uh, my husband and I think I, we, we moved to New Hampshire from Iowa in 91. And we were married and started to settle down and have a family. Um, I think it was the year before, 92, Trish uh, had studied some opera. And she had come to a company that my husband and I had started called Opera Fest of New Hampshire. And she sang with us for a couple of gigs, and we got to know her a little bit. Um, She then, I believe, went on to become Miss America, or maybe it was Miss America, and then she sang with us. But it was right in that time period of 92, 93. And uh, so it was kind of interesting when I saw on the news that uh, she's going to be one of the co-hosts for the debate, one of the moderators. Um, yeah, that oh, is I know cool. her. I mean, and now she's in news. You yeah. Know? Um, she's got this show on uh, F, uh, Fox Business Network. Yes. So that's uh, uh, the Intelligence Report, it's called. I have never. I don't watch a lot of TV news, so yeah, I've never either. seen her. But uh, that's a pretty fascinating thing. Uh, yeah. you know, wow, well, that's pretty cool. So, yeah. all right, it is the first segment. Dun, dun, dun. I don't have the music right, queued up. So speak amongst <laughs> yourselves for just a moment speak while, amongst I, ourselves while I attempt while you I attempt to MacGyver something with our phone connection because the little uh, retaining clip has fallen off one end of our handset cable. Oh, lovely. And I want to make sure that I don't disconnect myself as I nearly did when speaking with uh, with Carly Fiorina. That works. All right. Little, reta- right, little retaining uh, fastener. Inge- ingenuity. So you have engineers laying around. You need to keep them handy yes. just in case something breaks. <laughs> um, and, and this is Brock Talk, so something always breaks. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You know, bubble gum, duct tape, we are fixed. paper clips. Hey, We're ready. If it works. Bailing wire, <laughs> whatever's handy. Yeah. Anyway, elastic bands. Elastic bands have oh, always been a staple uh, of this program. Oh, so, th- thinking of staples, was, was that about weapon control and, oh, and staplers? <laughs> staplers, yeah. That uh, was, and then, uh, and uh, then you uh, finished it with that was easy? Yeah, that was easy. Uh, I was rolling Where on the ground there? groaning over that, that was one. That's funny. Uh, well, you know, here I am. Just I had a couple minutes. I haven't been blogging as much. Somebody and I came across this article on Drudge. Southbridge, Boston, middle (laughs) high school, locked down Wednesday afternoon after students reported seeing a weapon. The building was put into (laughs) shelter-in-place lockdown, and no weapon was found. No. Sources tell WBZ that a student was waving a stapler, and other students thought it was a gun. Now, the title of this post is... Why should almost everyone have at least some basic firearms training? Oh. And then there's a picture of a stapler, and the caption reads, The Bostitch Semi-Automatic Tactical Stapler in Black, because that's just so much scarier. Free box of ammo with any purchase, not shown. Way too scary. Yeah. It's a stapler. Nuts. I know. It's a stapler. It we're, reminded we're so me crazy. of uh, when I was I interviewed Janine Notter because she had uh, she dropped her cell phone in the in the house chamber and one of the Democrats sitting next to her goes, Is that your gun? You don't even know what a gun looks like? No. I, what is wrong no, with no, this no, stapler? No, 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 they no they don't. 
Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, you talk about high schools and, and guns. I mean, you know, 20 or 30 years ago in America, the teenagers, would show, especially in rural areas, would show up in their uh, pickup trucks with their gun rack on the back, and nobody would give it a second thought. No. And the crazies wouldn't dare come around either because they knew that 50 kids would go out and grab shotguns immediately. Uh, you know, uh, you think that Britain is totally disarmed. Well, you know, in the 60s, when I was in the, the equivalent of high school, we had an armory at the side of the playground, an armory. Okay. We, uh, with a <laughs> How couple, far they've come. <laughs> with, a, with a couple of trained, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> teachers as, as military officers. They mm-hmm. were military, reserve military officers and a cadet force. And some of the armorers were kids from 16 to 18 in the, you know, the upper years of high school. And were, were completely proficient in uh, maintaining the inventory, making sure everything was kept track of, making sure everything was signed in and out, uh, making sure all the guns were cleaned, everything mm-hmm. was locked up. And the, the steel door was uh, was properly secured at the end. Uh, you know? We're, we're and, so and, far and, and away and from you that. You had... You, if, if l- you wait, wait. Let me guess. You had all kinds of shootings and trouble. Yeah. Uh, no. None, none, none <laughs> at all. None a, at all. A, except in rural areas when we went out to the range and were shooting stuff at 100, 200, 300 yards. Yeah. I mean, it's, with a, it's Lee, a, a sad case. Mm. You, did you guys see that news article, the uh, article that came out this week about a woman that was, I forget what state it was, but she was feeding her four-month-old baby upstairs. And uh, a guy comes in, and uh, or I think it was two guys, kick in the front door. They were armed. And uh, she was upstairs, and fortunately she was armed as well. And shot, you know, here they have this firefight in the house. She was wounded twice. But she fought them off. I mean, you know, they left. Before she called 9 she goes up and checks on the baby, makes sure the baby's okay. And I guess she's in the hospital with a, an abdominal uh, gunshot that, you know, she'll be fine, they said. But um, it turns out that she was like a, um, what are they, it's not ROTC. What's the other, when you volunteer, uh, isn't that terrible? Oh, National, National Guard. Yeah, yeah, I think she was a National Guard gal and, uh, you know, had a gun. And these guys walk right into the house and start shooting away. I mean, what are they talking about? Whenever you start seeing all this fear, especially, you know, women, yeah. oh, you know, we should be afraid of guns. What an equalizer. What would that woman have done with a four-month-old upstairs without the gun? Exactly. Uh, although she'd have probably gone Mama Grizzly on him anyway. Yeah, I probably agree. Don't, you know, don't well, screw with I mean, Mom. There's, there's so much don't. damage you can do with furniture, I mean, when you have two guys. Yeah. yeah, it's true. But you know yeah. what? There is something to be said for the fact that there are moments. I mean, having been mugged twice, th- three times now, um, there is something to be said at the moment that you go through this alternative universe. At least I did. Where it must have been like the rush of the adrenaline comes in, and yeah, I would listen. If somebody, if somebody was at risk, um, don't bet against the mum. No. <laughs> Don't do it. I really believe that. You know, unless unless you're someone that's, you know, that the mom is super, superior in passivity, you know what I mean, just a passive, passive person. Usually yeah. a mom Testing. with a baby or, or with a, a youngster there yeah. will fight to the death to save the kid, which sure. is the way it should be, right? Yeah. Mm, crazy stuff. So, yeah, you know, we'll spit on guns. And this, this initiatives, these U.N. stuff that Obama is – and the executive orders that he's threatening um, – you know, people better start really paying attention to this. I got in the inbox. Well, you know, don't declare what you got. Never register it and shoot to to kill anybody who yeah, comes to get it. That's that. That's the theory. Especially if they've got a blue helmet. Yeah, especially <laughs> if they have a blue helmet. But right now, evidently, there's a um, congressman in, in uh, what was it now? It must have been Arkansas. I can't remember now what state. Somebody sent me an email that she sent to a constituent talking about how hard Obama is working behind the scenes through political, all the political places that he possibly can get support to do an executive order, um, trying to find out who would support it, who wouldn't, uh, on on the Second Amendment. And, you know, you have to start to wonder. Look at what's happening in Europe with the with the Refugee invasion. invasion yes. It's an invasion because when you have groups of people in that number that come in without any desire to assimilate into the culture, it's no longer 
immigration. It's an invasion. And the people have realized that. The Hungarians are cheering their prime minister or or president who wasn't particularly popular before because... Uh He actually put up a fence, a yeah. serious fence with multiple well, layers, and they and, and and the invaders are having to go around Hungary. It doesn't now. matter anymore, though. They're coming in. I mean, uh, this week Austria for the first time put up a fence yeah. on the border, and it's, they're coming through the fence in droves. These countries are not able to absorb this kind of Well, millions kind of, of Austrians thing. are going out and buying shotguns or whatever else is legal uh, to defend themselves in their homes. You know, uh, next step is you just say, I need volunteers at the border ready to shoot to kill. Uh, well, they, that's they, your first they, tier. They, there'd be a million of them there right away. But that, I, I don't see that as the ultimate thing that's going to bring it all down. Once these immigrants are in these communities, don't forget, they're having children three, four times at the rate of the of the of the people in these countries, I mean, Europe is like two point one kids. No, 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 no. <coughs> they're, that, they're, way, they're way less. Is than it that. one point two? Two point one? One point two? Uh, G- G- Germany's completely upside down. Yeah. If they didn't have immigrants, they'd have no population growth. But but think about that. The Western culture, yeah, is going down, and it, this goes so far beyond stopping them at the gates now, because in one generation. Who is going to be left, except maybe the United States, to promote a Western civilization? Very few of the others. I think the Brits are waking up if it's not too late. Uh, We have to wake up before it's too late here. No kidding. We have to welcome in the right kind of immigrants. Right. Nothing against Latinos. We want lots of Latinos that want to assimilate. We don't want La Raza who want to be a separate race. We Mm. want the folks that want to come here and be Americans and work and and participate in the greatest economy in the world. Of course. And, and we want them to come and speak English. All right. We're going to take a really, really, really short break. Stay tuned. We will be right back. This is Grok Talk. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Rock Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrok.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, TheRockNHCR.com. Rock Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Rock Talk. Rock Talk. Grok Talk. I didn't know if you know it or not. This is Grok Talk. I know you hear it a lot in all the promos and stuff. Sorry about that. Here with Mike Rogers and Jane Cormier. Coming up in 15 minutes, Tim Wigley from the Western Energy Alliance, and then Leon Rideout and Bill O'Brien. So stay tuned. In the meantime, we're just kind of killing time covering the news of the day, the week, the month, the yeah, year. You know what? I want to I bring up something. We were just talking about the Islamization of Europe, um, and it brought to mind the fact that I spent a little over a year and a quarter living in Vienna, and... When I went to go over and take a job off an opera of, a, of an Austrian opera singer, mm-hmm. okay, there was definitely in that com- at least in Vienna at that time. Now we're talking what 90, 90, 1990. Um, there was you know little signs all over the community everywhere saying um, you know "Geh weg Auslandern, Ausland, get out foreigners." Right? There was this movement going on in the nineties. Look at how far we've gone. Now, when I, when I moved into the community at that point in Vienna, I had to go to the police office, the police station. I had to sit down for an interview. I had to have all of my papers from the theater. I had to have photos taken. I then had to go to City Hall and do another set of that. And then for the first couple of months, I had to go back and check at the police station to make sure that they knew that I was still living at the address that I had signed in on as an immigrant. Okay? Mm-hmm. And... 
I never once had this thought that I should be doing anything else because I was working and living in Vienna and I had to follow those laws and those rules. Whether I liked them or not was not the point. The point was is that that was what you did. And you learned to speak the language. You, God forbid you ever went anywhere in Europe, whether it was Italy, Russia, or, or Germany, or Austria, and tried to not speak the language. It was considered, in 1990 anyway, that was just, that was a polite thing to do. You try to speak the language of the, of the country a- a- you're living in. Absolutely. I mean, the French have great disdain for people that totally. can't, speak, can't speak French properly. But you know what? If you try, they will they'll help. suddenly turn around and speak to you in English. If you don't try, <laughs> they'll speak to you in French, it happens French everywhere. fast enough that you can't hear, you they're, can't understand They're them. just a little nastier about it. That's all. But yeah. they're the same. it's like that all over the country. Right. Those yeah. in, in if Europe. you show up with your, pa- with your phrase book and ask for help, you'll get it. Right. If you, if you talk English louder, you're going to get... To, you'll get put down. You'll get put down. And, yeah. and you know what? I saw that in the 90s. I'm sure it's still the case now. But the truth of the matter is when you look at that through the political mirror, or the political, you know, whatever you're looking at there, and you go and you fast forward to today, what has happened to these countries that have lost their identity for any sort? It's like a patient losing its will to, their, their will to live. I mean, essentially, they've, they've given up. They've thrown, they've thrown up their hands. Given they've, up. they've turned up their toes. It's dead, Jim. Uh, you know, can we resuscitate it? No, you're right. They have given up. So now what has happened, hopefully, and in, in, in looking this long range, you can only – isn't this a terrible thing to say? That they're going to now have to wake up because we know that Islam is not a religion. Islam is a political uh, ideology. It's a way to to in, in integrate through these fanatical religious concepts a political way to uh, oppress. And that, I think, segues into that is why I think the left has an affinity for Islam because they're both <clears throat> belief systems. Uh, you know, socialism, the left, it's a belief system. You have to worship the state. You know, right. Uh, in, in Islam, you worship Muhammad, but mm. Muhammad is the state. The state, well, say moi. The state, right. L'état, so, say moi. No, you're right. So what's going to happen now with these communities that, first of all, we're going to be, you know, it's like the song Imagine, that stupid Lenin song. I've always hated that song. I'm sorry. You know, what a stupid utopian idea. It, first of all, it takes away the, the, the entire thing that our founders understood was that we're all flawed, some, you know, less evil than others, but we're all flawed human beings. Imagine, quote, ain't ever going to happen on this realm. So why do we perpetuate the myth? So they let all the borders go. They became a union. Now there was no difference. You know, we had to work as one people. You know, we're all together in this, blah, blah, blah. Now here, they're under attack. And they're putting up border controls against each other. Now what is that? So maybe in this whole dysfunctional, bad, you know, bad dream of imagine, they'll have to start looking at what the flaw was all about, and maybe they can have a correction. Yeah. That's the only hope. Yeah, I, I mean, they're still countries. Free movement of people and labor doesn't mean no border controls. It means you show a European passport of some sort. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm crossing from, say, Hungary into Austria, if I've not mixed up my geography, that may, may not be adjacent, but you get the yeah. idea. Yeah. Uh, if, if I'm crossing from, one East, from an Eastern European country into a Central European country, uh, and I don't have a, a passport issued by a European country, right. I'm automatically going to get stopped. Well, that doesn't happen right now. Right. Uh, they basically let people flow just about everywhere inside the European Union with, with no controls it's at the crazy. borders. Well, it's no different from uh, Los Estados Unidos, you know, the, the, the United States, where we have agreed as a common people not to have border controls. Uh, but, you know, we established our more perfect union a little differently. Well, they, we're supposed to have border controls. We just don't enforce any of them. Duh. No, 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 I'm not talking about the external border controls. We don't have any border controls between the sovereign states. Oh, by, I got by, you. Within by, the country. By, by yeah. agreement, because yeah. we have a commerce department, which is to prevent any right. impediments to commerce, not what it gets used for today. Right, within the country. Great. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It's just a crazy thing. I remember when we were walking, when I would walk around in Vienna, I had to have on my person every day my passport and my papers. Mm-hmm. Because they could stop you on a Strassenbahn. <laughs> they could stop you in the U-Bahn. They could stop you on the street and say, ask you where you're from. Because, you know, you can't tell 
who, when you live in a country, you can start to see the differences between even how people hold themselves. You can tell who is a Viennese and who isn't. And, um, you know, they could stop you at any time, at least they could then, and say, they could fine you, they could throw you out of the country if you did not have your passport and your papers on your person. Well, you know, when I first came here as a legal immigrant with my paperwork, I was told that relatively minor infractions could get me deported. Uh, now you can rape and murder and not yeah. get deported, and, and then they get all outraged when Donald, Donald Trump says so. Mm. Yeah. What is that? How backward. It's just so backward. Hard to believe that we've come this far. Working on problems. Sorry. Didn't mean to be so quiet. No, that's all right. Yes, it is not a pretty situation. And um, let's see what else we got to talk about here. We have a lot of things going on, and I can't find any of them. Uh, no, there's another debate coming up. Is it next week? There Tuesday. Is, there's Tuesday. another. There's a debate coming up Tuesday. So, folks, listen up, wake up. This is on Fox Business Network. Check your cable listing and make sure you get Fox Business. Where I am, it's on Channel 83. Your mileage may vary. Uh, but just make sure you get it so you don't miss it. Uh, it didn't they say they're also going to play it on Fox, Fox, the Fox News station? Maybe. Uh, no, Fox News doesn't, doesn't carry it. Unless they've changed their uh, their mind, I, I looked, don't know. I should. Look. I, look, I looked at my program lineup. It wasn't advertising the debate on on regular Fox News when I looked. Okay. So it's it's on Fox Business Network. So since that, it. it's not exactly a premium channel, but just make sure it's in the list you're getting, folks. Uh, the other thing that's different this time is that they've started to shrink the size of the debates and to put in a more formal cutoff. Now, you know, the uh, some of the candidates are objecting to which polls were used. Uh, the RCP 30-day average is a little different from, from the four polls that were chosen. But the key thing is, you know, we, we, we've gone from, you know, 10 plus 7 to 11 plus 5 after Perry dropped out to, um, was it 10 plus 4, and now we're at 8 plus 4. Hmm. And so the, the lowest performing on the main stage are now on the secondary stage. So uh, Huckabee and Christie are now down there with Santorum and Jindal. And uh, Kasich, not sorry, not Kasich. Uh, I wish um, Gilmore. <laughs> Gil- Gilmore. I feel sorry for him. He's a nice guy. Uh, yeah. Lindsey Graham. I miss him. He's going to be. He's the funniest guy. And uh, Pataki, uh, Mr. Big, uh, to the <laughs> tallest guy in the room. Uh, they're all nice guys. They're all funny guys, and they're no longer on the stage at all. And they're a little miffed about it. Pataki was recorded as saying, hey, you know, come and find me. Uh, put up a podium in the middle of the park. I'll debate you anywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nippy. I will have to have him back on because he wasn't on very long. And he was uh, he was a, a good guest. Alicia, if you're listening, bring the governor. Uh, he's welcome. He's funny. Uh, and we'll make sure he doesn't bump his head on the doorway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he makes for good radio. Mm-hmm. He does. He 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 does. But well, he's uh, anyway. a good speaker. He's a yeah. good communicator. Listen to him when he presents his ideas. Yeah. Um, he presents them in such a fine way that you almost start to like like what he's saying, and then you stop to think about the context, and you go, "No, nah, I can't do that." Yeah, and you know, and Gilmore started off uh, you know a little bit uh, indeterminate. His, the first interview we did with him at, at CNHT. I mean, that's a very distracting environment. He wasn't really focused. Uh, when we spoke to him again at uh, the RLC convention, uh, RLC convention. Oh, calling our, our next on. guest is, is calling. Is in, calling, and uh, on. I'm going to put him on. Uh, He's going to have to wait a minute, but then let me turn that, take that off. Uh, we're going to go take a quick break in a, a few seconds, and um, uh, after that, we're going to have uh, Tim Wigley on. I'm just kind of killing some time till I press this little button. <laughs> killing time, killing time, killing time. And, uh, yeah, we'll bring him in in just a minute. Just uh, keep him on the phone for a couple more seconds. Yeah, I'll take him off monitor. He can listen to the segment break, okay? We'll be right back. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, 
the right to know law. And now, at the top of our list is voter fraud. You have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. All right, welcome back to segment 2 a, I guess we'll call it. <laughs> well, actually, wait, we started at 8.30 this morning. We were a little early to uh, speak to Carly Fiorina, who, uh, again, thank you very much for making time to, to speak to us this morning. Candidate Fiorina, we appreciate it. Coming up later on, we will have Leon Rideout, who's running for the New Hampshire State Senate, uh, the State Senate, not the U.S. Senate, and then Bill O'Brien, former New Hampshire House Speaker, who will talk to us about the race for U.S. Senate. We'd like to, uh, uh, we'll wait for that to happen. But uh, for now, we want to talk to our next guest. He is, I just dropped his bio off the top of my desktop. Uh, Tim comes from the Western Energy Alliance. Uh, he has extensive experience, experience in educating policymakers on energy, forest management, mining, and manufacturing issues. And uh, from 1998 to 2002, served as president of the Oregon Forest Industries Council. And we'd like to welcome Tim Wigley to the program. Good morning. Nope, hang on. There we go. Tim, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, it's you have this internet radio show thing and technical problems abound, but we're not going to talk about technical problems because we bigger fish to fry in the name of the clean power plan. And um, we've been uh, at GraniteRock.com, we've been going after our own Senator Ayotte, who uh, expressed some public support for the plan, and of course we, we are totally opposed to it. Well, it's... Uh as you saw yesterday with the president's announcement on on Keystone, you know that this is it's a prime example of kind of what this administration's attitude is about a, a host of things. And clearly, with the clean power plant plan uh, hurting rural Americans, particularly, uh, we we're, we're in the thick of, a, of of an attorney general battle here in Colorado with, with the governor's office. Uh, uh, it is going to cause all kinds of hardships on, on, on particularly rural Americans and poor Americans who are going to pay through the nose on, on uh, heating and, and, and cooling bill, bills throughout the year. So uh, this administration is clearly out of control. Do you guys have a, an estimate on what it's going to cost in job losses, job losses to the industry? Well, as far as how it impacts the oil and natural gas industry, I don't have figures like that. But, but just if you look at... Uh, what I see from coal mining jobs that have been lost, I've seen the estimates being around 40,000 coal jobs that have already been lost due to uh, rules and regulations put forth by this administration. And, you know, th- th- there never seems to be any concern from the administration about job loss, economic impact, and so forth. I, I swear they don't take that into consideration whenever they make these decisions. It's all about an agenda that, that they want to push forward, and it's concerning. And, and I'm telling you, People are going to feel financially. It's, I've always I've, I've been involved in, 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 in battles over environmental policy for years, and I've always said it, it's kind of cool until it starts costing you money. And these rules and regs put forth in a host of areas are going to start costing Americans money. Well, we, we're up here in New Hampshire, and of course we've been suffering under the yoke of RGGI for a long time now, so I'm very familiar with the effect of carbon trading schemes and the cost of electricity. New Hampshire is usually one of the top five, or at least in the top five, uh, ten, for uh, cost of kilowatt hour, uh, cost per kilowatt hour. So uh, one of the things that I was looking at when I was writing about um, the Clean Power Plan uh, over at Watchdog.org was that this plan actually – I'm includes a cap and trade scheme which i don't think people realize you know that what this is going to do to the cost of electricity there's no question about it and, and quite frankly uh, uh people are not paying attention to the degree that they should these things are so complex so complicated if you've noticed a trend that a lot of times these rules and regulation packages come out on a friday evening or they come out on a holiday weekend and so forth i fully expect something to come out at Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's just because no one's paying attention, but, but people are going to start paying attention because they're going to start noticing it in their 
in their monthly statements they get from their, from their utility. And you know, it, it's just unfortunate that, that we're in a situation in this country that this administration clearly is trying to to repay their friends in the environmental community, uh, repay uh, allegiances and loyalties they had to them. And But unfortunately, it's going to be in the backs of some of your listeners. Well, it's going to be on the backs of some of their constituents, too, which is a really interesting thing. Uh, the unions are all bent out of shape over Keystone, which is good for our, from our point of view. Uh, and, uh, you know, this thing costs jobs. It's mostly costing union jobs, too, and it's, it's hurting, as you say, the middle and working class, which, again, uh, a lot of those are union folks. Uh, uh, you know, Barack Obama is doing more damage to the Democrat Party as any, than anybody else. Unfortunately, he's getting so far along with his agenda that uh, it may not matter in the long run. Yeah, you know, I, I know you guys in a state like New Hampshire uh, carefully watched the election results from around the country on Tuesday, and I saw the aftermath figures of what actually has happened to the Democrat Party as far as number of seats, governorships, legislative patrols, and so forth. I mean, he's been devastating to them. And I have many good friends that, 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 that work in the unions. I used to re- represent some of the private sector unions in a previous job. But I keep, I keep reminding them, look, guys, if the elections have consequences. And clearly this administration is not uh, concerned about the working man. They're concerned about an agenda. And quite frankly, it's scary. And, and I'm worried, I'm truly worried about the next 14, 15 months until he actually leaves office, what more damage he can inflict. I I have a question for you, Tim. My name is Jane Cormier, um, and my question is, you talked about when the the citizens are going to start feeling this. What is the time frame for when this kicks in to when we will start seeing it on our electric bills? Well, you're already starting to see a lot of these companies, and again, I represent oil and natural gas companies, not, not utilities, but you're already, as I talk to my friends in the utility industry, uh, they're they're trying to, to educate people right now as to what the rules and regs are, what it means mm-hmm. to, to, to to them as operating companies, and what it's ultimately ultimately going to mean to uh, to constituents to customers. I would presume sometime you know early in in 2016, just like you're seeing in other things like Obamacare and others, if some of this stuff mm-hmm. starts to kick in, and people will will, will start feeling the impact of it. Uh, so will it be like Obamacare right now is imploding and, and the costs are going up. The further into it we go, you know, the, the higher the costs go. Is this going to be very similar where it will be, you know, easy to perhaps look at at the beginning because it won't be so much as it will maybe a year or two in? I think there's a very strong possibility of that. And while I wish no ill will to anybody like me ha- you know, having to pay our my monthly bill from, from my local utility, Unfortunately, it, it may take some pain like that to get people's mm. eyes opened and, and, and get them activated in thinking about, you know, who they choose in 2016, whether it be, I heard you guys promo, whether it be legislative seats or U.S. Senate seats or governor seats or whatever. They have to think about this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. but uh, sometimes we don't get there until we have to feel some pain. There you first. go. Yep. So uh, one of the problems that uh, one of the other kinds of pain that people don't really see comes from the regulatory cost. And, of course, the oil and gas industry in particular bears a tremendous, tremendous regulatory cost. Um, and, and people don't get it. It's, 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 it's tens of billions of dollars annually. Let's just take a kind of a hypothetical. What happens to the price of oil and gas, let's just say, if somebody were to cut even just half of those regulations? Well, I think what you'll there are several things, and I don't I don't mean to to, to, to dodge your question or evade it, but there, there, there's so many things that have, that have come at us. Uh, you you followed recently uh, uh, new federal fracking rules that have been tossed out by a judge, or at least temporarily tossed out. Fracking is nothing new; it's been around since the 1940s. It's always been regulated by states, whether it be your state if you have oil and gas production, or, or here in Colorado and elsewhere. Uh, states are closest to the resource. They got people on the ground. They know what's happening and they know the topography and so forth. Yet the federal government felt the need to issue some new rules and regulations about fracking, increasing cost, increasing difficulty in getting permits to drill and so forth and so on. We filed suit against that and recently won a case up in, up in uh, Wyoming where the federal judge basically put it on hold. It's just a prime example of things working very well 
things working pretty efficiently, if you can get much efficiency out of federal government, and yet they feel like it's going to make the process better if they add yet another layer. And so, as it relates to the price of oil, it's a very, very delicate situation. To drill an, an average well, no matter where you are, is going to be 3 to $5 million. And you don't know for sure you're going to strike you know, black gold or whatever you want to call it. If you add on the, the uh, just unbelievable cost on top of that, it makes it less attractive for people to go do the exploration and do the production. So you have the possibility of, here we are now, the largest producer of oil and natural gas in the world in this industry. This administration wants to deter that, wants to dampen it. Yeah, I, I, and, yeah. and a quick word on, on fracking. Uh, you know, uh, most of us have well water. Well, guess what? New Hampshire's on granite. How do you squeeze water out of a stone? My well company offers fracking for water. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's become the, the, the great fundraising tool for the other side. Yeah. They're, they're trying to scare people you know, with, with fracking. It's new technology, and we need to study it longer. That's nonsense. And it's, it's not just fracking. What's really changed the game in oil and gas is horizontal directional drilling. And, and so the ability to drill down two or three miles and drill out two or three miles underneath the surface. It's, it's amazing technology. Ten years ago, even though fracking was around, nobody had any idea America would have the presence we have in production of oil and natural gas. Imagine what ten years later from now could be like. How about um, uh, sort of a two-part question? One, obviously, uh, there's a lot of uh, resources that we can't get at, which brings me to point two. It's all tied up on federal land. Do you see any, is there, we always talk about, there's a lot of federal land in New Hampshire. If you look at the map, it's scary how much of it is. Absolutely. Not anything like out west where the (laughs) entire states are are locked up by the federal government. But um, is there any movement in the states to do anything about the federal land monopoly? Yeah, there is. And, And I wish my friends in New Hampshire and other parts of the East Coast could come out here and literally see and view a map and see the ownership by the federal government in many of these states, and most of these lands, are they're not paying taxes to support schools, they're not helping create businesses, and so forth. A number of legislatures out here in the West have been dealing with this for the last few years in a pretty intent way of just basically telling, uh, if, if this administration is going to ignore the rules, and a lot of these states are saying, well, why don't we just take back the land? We're better able to manage it. We're we're here and so forth. So it, it's growing momentum. Uh, if if President Obama was was to be able to run for a third term, I think he would see it get even more intense because people out here are just tired of it, they're tired of being surrounded by forests that burn every year because the federal government doesn't manage it. And they're tired of, of of seeing this great opportunity for jobs, economic development, tax revenue, and so forth unable to be tapped because the president doesn't like oil and natural gas. So you heard what he said yesterday. He wants to push to keep it in the ground. He said that yeah, because it's press conference doing so much good there. <clears throat> <laughs> we actually had a good friend of ours, uh, Jerry DeLimas, who went out uh, during the Bundy Ranch uh, standoff, and he was out there uh-huh. actually leading the defense of the ranch. So we had a good interview with him. So we're we ha- just us, you know, in this room at Granite Rock. Come, we're very familiar with that situation. But again, it is it is it is bad. I think that you're absolutely right. There should be tours of Easterners, East Coasters, who, who go out and then I'll go. Okay, try to go for a walk and don't step on any federal land. Good luck. You know, it just well, you know. <laughs> Like, like species, I mean, if the the gray wolf is a majestic animal, it's beautiful. It also eats cows and livestock and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so many of us in the West have always wanted to get bills introduced in Congress to, to, to reintroduce the gray wolf to Central Park in New York City. <laughs> Let people there understand what it's like. <laughs> These things yeah. sound good, but they don't accomplish anything. Mm. Right. All right, well, we got about a minute. Um, how do people reach you or get in touch or help? Western Energy Alliance is a trade group representing about 500 oil and gas companies in the Rocky Mountain West. It's real simple, westernenergyalliance.org. You can learn all kinds of stuff about fracking and how we produce energy, maps on economic impacts of regulations and all that. And we'd love to have people join us at westernenergyalliance.org. All right, Tim, thanks so much for taking some time. Thank you. You Thank you. You have a good weekend. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you very much. A little update on energy, oil and gas. Uh, We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be right back to talk about who the heck knows what, because it's Grok Talk. 
This is a coalition of New Hampshire taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House, this is Law Talk. This is Grog Talk. I am here with Jane Cormier, Mike Rogers, I am Steve McDonald. We are in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the State House in the palatious CNHT studios. Thank you again to them. Visit them at cnht.org and, uh, you know, uh, read what they write and follow the links and make a donation and, and say thank you. And, and, and anything with a roof, uh, internet service, and... Uh, you know, somewhere where some just, electricity and yeah. electricity is is palatial as far as I'm concerned. That's pretty much it. Yeah. It, it works. It's our studio. We need a table big enough for our junk. <laughs> That's really all we need. Uh, all right, so we have uh, a few minutes before our next guest comes on. Leon Rydot's going to join us from the North Country to uh, talk about his uh, race for Senate, uh, his uh, opponent, and uh, some wacko Democrat lunatic from the left. Who is it? I forget. Is it Woodburn? Oh. Who's in Who's in Who's in Senate seat District One? I don't remember. I can't remember. Isn't that terrible? Yeah. yeah. Well, is that's it, okay. Might be a wood, wood Is wood it paper. Is it currently a Democrat? Yes. Yes. I believe it is. Okay. Well, why would Leon be running otherwise? Unless it was a horrible Republican, which is very possible. I, I apologize. That's <laughs> yeah. We have them, we, don't we, we? we should never overlook the possibility that it's a horrible Republican. That's true, especially recently. Anyway, that's uh, uh, that's a good and topic. Even the ones that good tell topic. us they're not. Uh, well. They don't always tell us the truth. They don't, do they? That's why they're horrible. They're horrible. They yeah. just, ugh. Oh, it's been an interesting year. Well, I, I it's mean. It's an interesting year for horrible Republicans in New Hampshire. Yeah, we've, yeah. Had, we've had majorities that don't mean it. Mean anything? They don't. They mean absolutely freaking nothing. You well, know, and and the news like uh, like Tim was just talking about the elections again. You know, you have states. Uh, you know, you have thirty something like 37 states with Republican governors. 20 of those have complete Republican legislative control. Uh, they've been moving, you know, to the right. And in here in New Hampshire, we have everything but the governor's office. And yet still, these losers promote Medicaid expansion. They promote the hands-free law. Yep. They promote all this crap that's on the Democrat Party's checklist right. when they're in a position to prevent all of it. Because it's too hard. More spending. Right. I mean, why would I elect a Republican who's going to do that? Well, uh, I mean, let's, you know, you talk about uh, our folks uh, doing the Medicaid expansion uh, and teaming up with the Democrats. Uh, you know, Ohio was far worse. They had this Republican legislature and a Democrat. Oh, sorry, no, Republican Governor Kasich. And the legislature voted... They put forth a bill which would have made it impossible for Ohio to accept Medicaid expansion. The governor vetoed the bill and then got together with one of his uh, small secret committees to accept Medicaid expansion anyway. Yeah, and to actually, I think, accept it in a larger format than it was yeah. originally being premised. So, so <laughs> you know, it may, they may as well have had a Democrat governor. Ah. And, and that's exactly why, you know, the, the folks on, on the Journal Editorial Report last Saturday said, you know, the voters don't know what they're getting because he talks about being a uh, a practical or is that pragmatic conservative, which yeah. is uh, when, whenever you hear the word pragmatic, remember, remember it has its origins <laughs> in Marxism. <laughs> Uh, pragmatism, Marxism go, ha- go. go hand in hand. It's doing what's necessary to 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 move the the ball right. forward, basically. And uh, you know, when you when you've got a guy that talks about uh, about fiscal responsibility and balanced budgets, and the other folks being amateurs, and then advances his own liberal positions, yeah, the voters wonder what they're getting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all that federal money that they took in with expan- with Medicaid expansion, right? It sort of it helped on the short end, right? But long end. We're watching Obamacare implode. 
I mean, you see article after article of everybody that's now finding out that even when they thought they were safe, everything price is going well, way well, up. Well, well I, I mean, my employer healthcare has way higher deductibles and is less affordable than it used to be, and that's employer healthcare. Private healthcare plans went off the charts two years ago. Yeah. You know, and every and every year I worry that it's going to become unaffordable to take care of our health, and that mm. you know I shouldn't have to. I have good people that employ me that do the very best they can to to give me uh, a good plan, and the government keeps on trying to screw it up. And I think that that's why, and and I. I believe that that's why this was very specific and carefully plotted, that Obamacare wasn't the end game. The end game was national health care. And they get that by so making it expensive that people that were used to being covered can't pay for it anymore. And they'll now jump on the bandwagon saying, well, we need something. we got to right. fix it. we got to well, fix it. we got to fix it. Um, I- Here's here's a topic that needs deeper investigation. So first of all, let me, let me just say that you know the Medicaid expansion is a case of the king's shilling. Uh, and I'll get blank looks from the Americans amongst me. Yeah. In the uh, in not exactly medieval times, more like in the uh, sort of seventeenth, eighteenth, and nineteenth centuries, you manned your ships, especially your wooden ships, by press ganging people off the streets. Mm-hmm. You rounded up fit young men right. in the pubs. Oh my! And if you took the king's money, you were considered to be hired. And they got in the habit of buying drinks and putting a, it was silver in those days, a shilling yeah. uh, at the bottom of the glass. If you took your drink and you had this king's shilling, you Jeepers. were you, you were rounded up by the rough guys and you were you yeah. were in the Navy, boy. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so Medicaid expansion is like that because you take the king's shilling and before you know it, you're, uh, you're press gained into their service right. and servitude because it's going to cost you in the long run. Of course it's it going to cost you a lot. There is no such thing as a free lunch or a free beer or free Medicaid. Right. We see the same thing happening with property rights, with regional planning regional planning commissions where they're usurping local laws yeah. by bringing in this other you know the 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 state the bureaucracy because this is all bureau- bureaucracy growth i mean you yeah. know epa of course not not obamacare but bloating the bureaucracy and then putting laws into effect that are really going to hurt well, you will know, always empower i i think if the states jointly and severally passed state laws that said right all administrative rules are null, void, and of no effect within within our borders. That that only an act of Congress judged to be constitutional will be considered as accepted law. Uh, th- those regula- you know, those those uh, bureaucracies would implode overnight. And they would, but you see that we are so behind in educating folks with states' rights. I and I've said it. It was the reason why I jumped in. In you know. 2010 started paying attention and talking because we we every turn we think that the federal government is the big daddy right they're the big power base and we have so neglected states power why would any state give its power up well, to a bloated, corrupt federal government. We're now 102 years into the usurpation of the rights of the states. Uh, and not, not that people like Alexander Hamilton didn't desire to do it from the outset uh, with uh, you know, a, a national bank and means of dispensing mm-hmm. favors, uh, but that was kept under control until 1913 when we had the Federal right. Reserve, the 17th Amendment, and, and the 16th Amendment, and so on. <sighs> and, and essentially, we, we flipped the relationship where instead of the states owning the federal government to do their bidding and, and defend the country, mm-hmm. we now have this federal government owning the states by dispensing cheap dollars yeah. and, and buying favors and coercion. But we can really make it, if we just, like you said, could get a coalition, even to start a coalition of states, wouldn't it have been great? And I always maintained if we could, and I know it's a cabal, a progressive cabal. I mean, Maine's making a shot at trying to become conservative. And then they're doing some good stuff up in Maine if you haven't been paying attention. But if you could get maybe New New England states to... It would never happen. Look at Massachusetts. It won't happen. It won't happen up here, but the Tenth Amendment Center has been working really hard on educating the, people the, about the, the, about the rights of states and, yeah. and the, trying the, to get – I think if you get a, a coalition of western states, especially on this issue of federal land management, yes. I think it's a huge issue for them. Obviously, Tim just explained to us the, the situation out there, which we were familiar with. Mm-hmm. But 
um, you know, you could really get a movement going where people are like, "Look, this is nonsense, all right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna Im- impose or enforce your goofy regulatory state. Uh, we're gonna manage those things ourselves. Too damn bad." Right. Right. But what do you do with the kids in school? My kids know nothing about this. They teach nothing about this in school. So you have an entire generation that turns eighteen that is oblivious to all of how, how little rights they have left, to how their government has stolen. And, well, that's certainly around and, here. And, yeah. and e- even they are beginning to worry about what the federal <clears throat> government is doing to them. And, you know, and, and whilst I don't agree with all of his policies, I applaud the way people like Jim Rubens went out to all the universities in the last round, for example, and getting the kids riled up over their individual rights. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, we <clears throat> need more people that are willing to do this, to willing to walk into the lion's den and, and address the university crowd. Uh, the Tenth Amendment Center, by the way, and I have been negligent, have brought out a new series of videos to help educate people about states' rights and some of the work that's being done. Wow. And I, I encourage the, the listeners to go to TenthAmendmentCenter.com, spell it out, uh, and uh, look up some of the excellent work of Michael Bolden and his, uh, and his cohorts, and we have to get him back on here. Uh, it, it's, it's fabulous. Dot com? I'm pretty sure it's dot And com. you can go on and get, get – can you have uh, a video and, that's and then ten, do – That's the word tenth as well. Okay. Can you actually, like, take the video and then do a small group with it? I, sure. Uh, it's I, online. You can do anything I, you I want. Th- I think you can. It's online. I don't think there's any uh, royalties uh, yeah. for it. Of course – uh, contributions are, are are very very much welcomed because yes. they run on a shoestring out of his apartment. They have volunteers around the country, wow. uh, and they have people in a lot of the legislatures. You know, I was thinking thinking of Tenth Amendment. Um, you know, and, and states' rights are, are very much demonized by the left because it's the antithesis of what they sure. want, which is central control. <laughs> you know, when Jack Kimball ran for governor and when he ran for the uh, the party chair, he was running, uh, amongst other things, on a Tenth Amendment platform. And that's part of the reason why he got demonized because uh, he's saying, you know, we can do this stuff without Washington. We don't need these. We can reject these. Right. That's a good question. And I think I've asked this before, but you've reminded me of it. You want to, you know, you have these local Democrats. Yeah. who want to be state senators and governors and stuff like that. And they're, like, always trying to be in charge. And you're like, well, what, what's wrong with you? Why can't you manage these things locally? You're, you're incompetent. You can't run a state this. You can't run a state that. You don't – your bureaucrats are incapable of managing these things at the state level. Well, you well, have to farm it out to the federal government. Well, what's well, wrong I, with I you? Mean, I mean, look, look at Hassan imploring all of the um, uh, presidential candidates to get involved in our heroin problem. Uh, not that there shouldn't be research and collaboration at the federal level, and I, and I believe that's what federal agencies should be about, research and collaboration, clearing houses. But, you know, why isn't our state do, taking action on our problems? It well, should, she's it, too busy running for office. She right. needs a CEO, so naturally. But it is, it's the same point. What is it about you, Governor Hassan, that makes you incapable of managing this problem at the state level? No, that's a brilliant, brilliant point, and nobody has really brought that to the fore. We... we we hear a lot of pissing and moaning out there, excuse my French, about what people are doing. But and at the same time, at the same time, we're always like, well, we send more money to the federal government than we ever get back. Well, why don't you just keep it here and spend it if you're so damn you know, smart? That's, that's really a really great point. We should find a way to put that out there because that that has never explicitly, in my experience watching all this in New Hampshire, ever been I, – I, I never thought of that no, myself. Why, why, why don't we take more – more uh, time to manage our own things. Before, Why can't you before do it? Steve makes the cutoff sign to my throat, um, we got about a um, uh, couple seconds. Right. <laughs> Why should the people in New Hampshire and throughout the East care about the fighting in California over the Delta smelt and the water? And the answer is: Have you seen the amount of food inflation we've had lately? Mm-hmm. Do you know that some of the best farmland in the country is going dry, is turning to desert? Do you know it's just because liberals are making a fuss over a fish too small to see, practically? Uh, and, and do you know that uh, if the state stood up and exercised its rights and said, we're sending out the National Guard to turn on, these, right. uh, to turn on the, the, the water to these farms, and we're going to stand guard over it, and if any federal busybodies come by, we're going to... We'll fight. We'll, we'll, f- we'll fight and we'll lock them up. Absolutely. Because it's our state, it's our resources, Why it's our not? water. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, 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 you know, when Arnold was elected, I thought that's what was going to happen, because <laughs> this problem's been going on since before Arnold was elected. All right, now um, I'm going to cut you off. Right. But anyway, that's a good point, and... and 
and it is food inflation. Anybody who's been to the grocery store and pays for these things knows. We will be right back after our uh, top-of-the-hour five-minute news break. Stay tuned for Leon Rideout. This is Grok Talk. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Oh, feel the power. Oh, I can feel it. Now a moment of triumph approaches. <laughs> it's Rock Talk. Coming up today on Grok Talk, we welcome presidential candidate Carly Fiorina back to the program. We've also got Tim Wigley from the Western Energy Alliance on energy and the EPA's clean power plan. New Hampshire Rep. Leon Rideout joins us to talk about his race for the New Hampshire State Senate. And former New Hampshire House Speaker and current New Hampshire Rep. Bill O'Brien has some thoughts to share about the 2016 U.S. Senate race as well as the upcoming legislative session. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Grok Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrok.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, The Rock NHCR.com. Grok Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Rock Talk. Former New Hampshire House Speaker Bill O'Brien called a meeting of conservative House members and activists this past Wednesday night to discuss finding a candidate to mount a campaign to replace Kelly Ayotte with a conservative Republican. The focus of the meeting, which was supposed to be kept secret but was leaked to the press, was to try and identify a single conservative candidate to challenge Ayotte in a primary. Readers of GraniteGrock.com will be familiar with our chronicling of her descent from first-year Tea Party senator to rhino stooge. This decline in principles has seen Ayotte support moderate and even liberal policy legislation on immigration, energy, taxes, and spending. Former New Hampshire House Speaker Bill O'Brien will be on this program later this morning to discuss the need to primary Senator Ayotte and to update us on the progress, if any, in identifying a candidate to do just that. Manchester held elections last Tuesday, and we'd like to congratulate our friend and occasional guest, Rich Gerard. Rich ran for and won a seat on the Manchester Board of School Committee. But the big race was for mayor. Mayor Ted Gatsis won his re-election bid as well, but only by 85 votes. Democrat challenger Joyce Craig has asked for a recount in what turned out to be a very high turnout election. We can't help but wonder if Craig lost because of earlier efforts by folks like Rich Gerard, Ed Nail, and to some degree GraniteRock.com, who pursued and reported on nests of out-of-state voters cluttering up Manchester's voter checklist. These pursuits prompted Manchester City Clerk Matt Norman to verify thousands of eligible voters in the city, and mo- a move that resulted in the removal of pages of current and former Democrat campaign operatives or their fellow travelers, listed as living and registered in the city, but who had long since moved on to mess with other people's elections in other states. New Hampshire native Chris Reagan of Hampton will be a moderator in the first of two GOP debates Tuesday, this according to Doug Alden, reporting for the New Hampshire Union Leader. Growing up in New Hampshire, the paper reports, Trish Reagan learned early how seriously Granite Staters take their role in the presidential campaign process. Next week, Reagan will become part of that process as a moderator in the first of two debates with candidates vying for the Republican nomination. It's a tremendous honor, Reagan said Friday. I'm very excited to play a role in this conversation about the fiscal future of our country. 
Reagan, host of The Intelligence Report on Fox Business Network, is one of three hosts for the 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time debate Tuesday, which features four candidates who did not make the cut for the Fox Wall Street Journal primetime debate to follow. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of CNHT, GreenwichRock.com, this station, or anyone else for that matter. In accordance with Title 17 U.S.C. Section 107, some of the material in this program is used under the fair use provision of federal copyright law. Sound effects were either created by the producers of the program, found free in the public domain, or are covered under Attribution 3.0. Most of the music on this program comes courtesy of Creative Commons licensing from Kevin McLeod at Incomatech.com. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House, this is Rock Talk. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of CNHT, GreenwichRock.com, this station, or anyone else for that matter. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk. Brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteRock.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteRock.com. talk. We'd like to thank everyone for listening and hanging in there, those of you who tune in on the podcast, and of course our listeners at therockandhcr.com. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Reminder, of course, we are on Facebook and Twitter. Just look for Granite Grok, and you can listen to this and past programs on Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and of course at GraniteRock.com. We are also on YouTube and Ustream. We'd like to also thank again Carly Fiorina for being on earlier in the program. If you missed her, uh, check back for the podcast later tomorrow or today, whenever it goes up, and uh, you can give a listen. Also, Tim Wigley from the Western Energy Alliance, and uh, we've already talked to them. So we're going to move on and talk to somebody new, uh, somebody from the North Country, somebody who has announced that he is running for the New Hampshire State Senate. Welcome to the program, New Hampshire State Rep, Leon Rideout. Good morning. Morning. Thank you for having me on. Hey, thanks for using a landline. (laughs) Yeah, it makes it a little better, huh? Oh, my Lord, the difference in audio quality is astounding. So um, (laughs) you're up there. How's the weather up there, by the way? Well, it's actually been fantastic for November, uh, but it's slowly changing and starting to cool off. Yeah, I know we've uh, we've had cold nights, and the, the <laughs> last couple of days haven't been too bad. There you go, Jane. I turned your mic down. You can you can cough at will. Once you get a tickle in your throat, it just doesn't go away. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, it's it's been very moderate this week, and I know that uh, uh, through November it's supposed to be above average for temperature. But uh, then we're going to get into the first of the year, and things are going to go back to winter. But oh yeah. <laughs> In the interim, in the interim, and going on into next year, you have announced that you would like to run for and uh, well, hopefully win the uh, it's District One, yes, New Hampshire State Senate District One. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, yes, and uh, you are challenging whom? Uh, Senate Minority Leader Jeff Woodburn is the current person that holds the seat. Okay, that's what we guessed. <laughs> 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 so, all right. Well, not, not not being North Country folks ourselves, we were scratching our heads trying to remember who was the who's uh, the district one, oh, who, who's man. the current incumbent. We know we know the name. Uh, we just didn't necessarily know it's district you, you, one. You obviously have loons up there. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> all right. So, and then of course, uh, Leon is a uh, the lead supporter for Griffin's Law uh, year after year after year, and uh, so uh, we're happy to have you on the show. So anyway. Um, I, I'm going to ask you why you decided to run, but I think I already know the answer. Well, yeah, I took a look around at the upcoming election year next year, and a lot of people were asking me to stay in the House. Uh, got a pretty good record in the House, I believe, and we were getting some stuff accomplished. But when I looked around at the North Country in the cog in the wheel of getting legislation for the North Country passed in the friction in the North Country between our elected leaders, it all points in one direction, and that is the current senator in the seat. He has been practicing partisan politics down in Concord to a degree which I think is actually kind of rare in Concord. And 
then he comes back up to the North Country and says he's doing the complete opposite. And it really irritates me when you have a politician that says one thing when he's back in his district and does something else when he's down in Concord. So you have a, you're have you irritated with a lot of politicians then. Kind of sort of like a senator that says one thing in New Hampshire and something else when she's down in D.C. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes, so. uh, and it, unfortunately it's more common than what is good for the state or the nation. The, um, uh, has anybody else expressed any interest in running against Woodburn? Uh, there is. Uh, I believe we'll have a primary. Okay. Cool. Any names? Or just suppositions well, and speculations? I hate to give, <laughs> give my opponents a plug, but Dolly McPaul okay. uh, is talking about running. She's been an opponent of Northern Pass. Uh huh. We we and don't even know who she is. I don't think I've ever heard I've never her name. I have heard the name either. No. 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 Okay. Is, is she in the State House right now? Uh, no, I don't believe she's ever held elective office. Um, mm. She's kind of championed the anti Northern Pass, anti Towers things uh she sat on a couple commissions about that okay but so her claim to fame is is that all right that's good to know anyway so um you know again we're not from the north country uh obviously northern pass is one of the many issues that concern people there and uh you know we're just down here in the in the southern part of the state going what's a big deal what's a big deal you know um you know we don't know so much you know we know where the north country is we go up there to to be tourists and stuff and uh, and but other than that I, I think there's a lot of things that go on up there issue wise that that most people down here in the in the southern part of the state aren't familiar with what would you list as maybe the top 3 or 4 concerns for people in the north country well uh Definitely the top concern is the economy, and local economy has struggled since the paper mills has shut down. Uh, we've lost thousands of jobs, and quite often when Governor Lynch was governor, he'd come up and when a mill would close, and he'd come up and say, we're going to get these jobs back, and we're going to do something, and then go back down the concrete and nothing happened. So economic policy is important to the North Country, but going hand-in-hand hand with that is current state tax policies in regards to business, in business tax reform that the GOP has been trying to get through, and we got a minor one through this year, but all those stifle the economic development in the North Country because you got a bad tax business tax rate, you've got travel costs, you've got energy costs in just the remoteness of the area. Mm. So, and I guess that's another area where I disagree with the current senator. He was talking that the business tax reform passed this year was only going to affect the 1%. Only going to affect the 1%. Well, there's hundreds of businesses that that tax reform will benefit because we did get it through from the little mom and pop restaurants that employ five or six people to our local hardware stores, which unfortunately are disappearing at a rapid rate up here. I bet they are. I bet they are. I mean, it's not like you have... Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, oh. no. Uh, hi, Leon. It's Jane Cormier. Hi. How are you doing, Jane? I'm, I'm good. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, you know, I've been... Uh, in the past years kind of looking at the North Country and it's really I think a sad state of affairs to watch how little our state has done to assist growth in any in any category up north but you know what I hear that because the past uh, decades have been ne so neglectful that the North Country has taken on a level of subsidy that's going to be very difficult to uh, work with for a real conservative so my question is, um, you're from the North Country, and you know what's going on up there. When you go out and you campaign, how, how will you address this, the, the subsidy issue, um, you know, and, and the, all, of the, all of the really neglect that's been happening within the State House with regard to, to the North Country? Well, and that is somewhat of an opinion up, up in the North Country is that people in Concord kind of forget about the North Country. Mm -hmm. I actually think we've made some progress in the last few years of getting some legislation that has helped the North Country. Good. And uh, so I kind of see that turning around and just me, myself, getting out there. I'm very open 
on my Facebook page for being representative, mm -hmm. what's happening in Concord. So there's more people that are actually hearing about what's going on in Concord. And I guess I want to dispel the, the kind of the feeling that there's people up here want the subsidies. And the current senator quite often will spout off about yeah. how the North Country needs this welfare program or this help and that. The people in the North Country are just like people everywhere in New Hampshire, and they really want less government. Mm -hmm. Leave me alone less regulation, and keep your hand out of my wallet. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in, in other words, take away the uh, the subsidies, maybe take away some of the taxes and regulations, and let these people thrive. You know, it always always makes me wonder, you've, you know, you're, you've got high-cost high energy, and you've got all these X mills. Uh, wouldn't they make great little hydro stations? Uh, they worked that in some places, and then, of course, they've got the Burgess Biomass Plant in Berlin, which, depending on which side you talk to, is, is a good thing or, or a bad thing. Right. Um, but part of that problem with that is is there are caps on in the whole energy regulation in the state of New Hampshire, to me, is crazy, and I can't say that I truly understand it, other than there's more rules and regulations on generating power and how much public service or Eversource now has to buy and what the rate they have to buy it at. And we need to get the state government out of that to a much bigger degree than what it is now. Because one of the reasons New Hampshire has, in my opinion, has such a high energy rate is because we've made bad decisions in Concord and we've forced energy companies to do things that weren't in their best interest. Mm -hmm. So we need we need to back off that, let some of these energy companies make decisions on their own. And we do have we have RGGI, we have the RCP, we have uh, you know the regional all the regional rules and regulations, the power sharing plans, and um, all of these things. You know, we were just talking to um, Tim um, Wigley, who's a uh, uh, works for a PAC, the uh, Western Energy Alliance. We were talking about the new latest screw up which is the clean power plan and how this will create a national cap and trade scheme when all that does is drive the cost of electricity up so uh yeah uh, i mean we have susan olson who of course has been building power plants or built power plants for 30 or 40 years she knows a lot about energy so we're, we're pretty well versed on the whole problem and yeah the uh, the errors in our ways have been going on since around 2005 2006 when the democrats got complete control of the state of new hampshire passed all these crazy environmental protection rules and how you had to use 25 percent green energy and how you had to and and of course they defined green energy without including at the time hydro and nuclear which was completely ridiculous and so the entire <laughs> right. scheme is built on the premise that they get to decide what is what kind of energy and what isn't and what counts and what doesn't and then they build up this regulatory structure uh and this carbon credit scheme to uh to support their premise and it just drives up the cost of everything. I mean, everything run, that runs on electricity, including government, costs more money. And um, so that's got to change. And it's got to change not just because, you know, it's easier for you guys to use your resources, including wood and biomass, to, to create energy and create jobs, but because those businesses are paying those electricity rates. They're paying those higher rates. They're paying higher taxes for the regulatory state that's making the rates higher. And all things considered, it's a horrible, complex mess. Uh, we're going to take a really quick break, uh, short break, Leanne. Stay on the line. We'll be right back. This is Grok Talk. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is the repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Uh, 
All right, we're back. Oh. We have uh, <laughs> Leon Rideout out on the and uh, Paul Bryant's here. And he's got his T-shirt, Law Offices of Atticus Finch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, all right, uh, let's, let's get those this. microphones turned up. <laughs> all right, well, Bill, welcome to the room. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> all right, we are talking to Leon Rideout, who has uh, announced his candidacy for District 1 in the New Hampshire State Senate up in the North Country, talking North Country issues, energy, uh, taxes, taxes, regulation, um, tourism, of course, is an important part of the North Country. Hello, Leon, how are you? Pretty good, Bill. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Do you mind if I identify you to the world as one of my favorite uh, New Hampshire state representatives? Absolutely not. <laughs> oh, good. I mean, you've, you've always been there for us. And you now, one of the things I, I think a lot of us, when we see you arrive every day at the state house, um, are just in awe of how far you come down and how much uh, dedication you've shown to the job. And you know, you're you're. Uh, I know you're running for state senate up there. Your constituents would be well served to have that kind of dedication and the principles that you bring to Concord. Um, you know, we were all lucky that you're stepping up, Leon. Well, I appreciate that, Bill. And, of course, one of the reasons I do think that I need to step up is because the current senator is more prone to self-promotion in photo ops than he is to working with his fellow senators and the county delegations that he should be working with. Yeah, I, I, he's known for that, and, and if he just limit, limit himself to those photo ops, then we could all just know that he's a waste of time, but he comes <laughs> down here and votes at the same time, and his votes are awful. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so, you know, best of luck to you, best of luck to your constituents, because if they elect you, they will be taking a step in the right direction. Well, thank you, Bill. So speaking of county government, people don't know much about county government in New Hampshire, I don't think, unless they're involved in government in general, uh, and even people who are involved in government don't always necessarily know about county government in New Hampshire, um, and uh, the, the county government is made up of uh, elected officials from the State House and the Senate, is that correct, or the Senators? I don't uh, know. So, so the, I don't even necessarily know. Yeah, so, so the um, legislature, in essence, for each county is, is described as the county delegation, and it's comprised of the state representatives from that county. Mm -hmm. And so um, you have county commissioners, they form sort of an, a, a, uh, an executive function, and then the delegation performs a legislative function. At the local level, you can analogize it to you have a board of, of selectmen, and then you have the uh, uh, town meeting. And the town meeting is the legislative group, the board of selectmen mm -hmm. or the executive group. So you've been doing that for a while now. Leon, talk to us about your contribution to the county government. Well, uh, county government, of course, one of the biggest things that we can affect up is the county delegation in that is the oversight of the budget in the budget process, just like uh, a town meeting. And uh, Bill has it exactly right. That's how I always frame it as is the county commissioners are the selectmen and the county delegation is the body of the town meeting. And actually, in the last three years in Coas County, despite at first having a 7-3 split within the county delegation and now having a current 5-5 split between the party, uh, we have managed to keep our county budget from growing very much at all. I can't say there was no growth, but there has, and last year we have almost a flat tax impact on the local residents. And that's kind of what we're aiming for again this year, just because, like I said, every time you reach into the wallets of the local residents, they have less money to spend on businesses, heating their homes, whatever. And that's something the current senator just fails to realize. He votes for tax increase after tax increase, and then comes up north and tells everybody what a good deal like the four cent a gallon tax increase is for the North Country, when every cent of it's going to widen I ninety three down in the southern part of the state. Yeah. While that project is a worthwhile project and it could be needed, the toll fee structure probably should be paying for it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, Leon, this has always been one of the issues that I've been most concerned about because we have uh, a constitutionally mandated highway trust fund 
in the Constitution is supposed to be dedicated to the to the highway's construction and, and repair, and yet uh, we've had it raided uh, budget after budget. Um, we find, for example, that money goes to the uh, capital crimes units of the Attorney General out of the Highway Trust Fund under some sort of vague connection that I guess you have to use the roads to get to a murder scene. So there ought to be some payment for it. We've had um, the uh, State Teachers Association come in and make that exact argument that uh, uh, teachers and schools ought to be funded out of the Highway Trust Fund because teachers ride to, to a oh school on roads. And so if, if, in fact, we would just dedicate that money, which comes from gas tax, uh, to the purpose for which it's being raised, we wouldn't have to raise taxes at all. We could uh, take care of the expansion of I-93. We could take care of the roads up in the North Country, which I know are, are very po important to a spread out population. Yet the Democrats have found a way to raid that fund, um, as your opponent has, yep. has uh, uh, voted for time after time, and then comes back and says, oh, my Lord, we don't have enough money to maintain our roads. Let's tax ourselves some mm -hmm. more. Yep, that's the, the leaky bucket. The leaky bucket. <laughs> now, you probably remember that leaky bucket that I had in the back of the uh, uh, state, the uh, Reps Hall. I, I, I sure do, and uh, and it's it's exactly right. And not only the highway fund, but every dedicated fund within the state of New Hampshire, in my opinion, is a joke because governors rate it, the legislatures rate them, so that there is no dedicated funds in New Hampshire, and I've mm. had people try to tell me otherwise, but in my three years down in Concord, I haven't seen any fund that is safe from an outreached hand when it's needed. Yeah, and, and the problem with dedicated funds is that it, they defeat budgeting transparency. There's dedicated funds all over the place. Some would surprise you. As a matter of fact, if you go to the legislative budget assistance or you go to the uh, state uh, budgeting uh, authorities, you ask them how many uh, uh, dedicated funds are they don't know. They, they, they don't. They, they seriously don't know. You know, the numbers come out different. You say, well, what about this one? I remember at one point I went to uh, the governor's office and asked a question. He came up with a, a <clears> list, <throat> and I asked him, well, where's the chief justice book fund in there? And they go, he has one? And, oh, and, and so, <laughs> you know, it's just it's, it's lack of integrity. It really is. So we really do not know how many? Are, are we, you totally we do not serious? know. No, no, we do not know. I have a suggestion, by the way, since you brought up that whole teachers need the roads thing. Shouldn't there be like a tax on union dues to pay for that? You know, to pay for, for cops and firemen and, and They'll teachers love that. to get to get to and fro and, and for their defense and protection. I think I think we should add one of those. Well, certainly a search tax on the wages <laughs> of, of union presidents and union bosses. That would definitely be very helpful. That's, that's oh. probably the only tax the liberals would ever oppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somehow, <laughs> Leon, I've missed uh, putting a bill in for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should have thought about it. It's good talking to you, Leon. You bring up the best of ideas. So. Yeah, you help <laughs> to stimulate us to, to new conversation. So uh, you want to get elected to the Senate. You want to get down to Concord in the, the other chamber, um, the uh, the softer chamber, I guess you might want to call it, because, I don't know, I, every time we see Republicans over there, I mean, we've had, we had some good luck last year. We got a couple folks in there who are much better uh, on principles and platform, and we certainly need some more. Uh, at, at, assuming you get elected, um, what do you see in the Senate as priorities? Uh, priorities will be economic revitalization of the North Country, keeping state government out of my constituents' wallets and out of their lives, uh, protecting school choice mm. for those parents and parental rights. And I will, of course, continue to champion Griffin's Law. It's uh, a pretty sad state of affairs when we have 14 Republican senators and we cannot get 13 votes to get a real fetal homicide law yeah. passed. Very sad. So I have put out some outreach to some senators. I am going to try to get a <clears throat> correctly worded fetal homicide law through this year. But uh, there's just recently been a case in New York State yeah. where a baby was born by cesarean section, lived for six days, and a court has ruled that the baby was not a baby because it was born by a cesarean section and would have died within the mother's womb if 
can been borne by cesarean yeah. infection. Which is totally takes everything that the progressives talk about with the fetal homicide laws because the baby was outside the womb and the baby was living for six days, which shows you their argument is total garbage. So the baby was viable, but they killed it anyway? That, well, the... They didn't necessarily well, kill it, but they weren't able to obtain justice for the criminal act that happened that ultimately took the baby's life. It was a DWI <coughs> car crash. Excuse me. And uh, like I said, it just emphasizes the fact that we have to get the wording right on this law. So That we can't okay, take a sorry. step back from the born alive rule, which I really feel the wording that was brought forward in the Senate last year. It's a disgrace. Took a step back from that because it said the baby had to be capable of sustained life. All right, Leanne, we're out of time. I'm on a hard break. i got to cut you off. Um, okay. How do people reach you? Uh, they can reach me on Facebook, or they can reach me my email, writeoutforrep at gmail.com. Uh, there's actually a new page, uh, Write Out for Senate District 1 on Facebook. And they can reach me on my cell phone, 603-631-4151. All right, Leanne, thanks for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you. No problem. All righty, enjoy your weekend, sir. Thank you, Leanne. Okay, you have a great one. Thank you. All right, you too. All right, this is Grok Talk. We'll be right back. Really short break because we're going right to the intro, and then we'll be back. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk. Brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Raw talk. Hey, welcome back. Told you it was a short break. (coughs) The, uh... We went right through the end of that that segment, right into the beginning of the next one. But that's okay, because Bill came early, and we already heard from him. So, uh, But we have some new discussion to engage in right here on Grok Talk, brought to you by GraniteGrok.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Just look for Granite Grok, and you can listen to this in past programs on Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, and iHeartRadio. Hey, Bill. Good morning. Steve. Good morning again. Good to have you here. Thanks for coming on on relatively short notice, I guess we could say. Yeah, it's usually bad. how we wrestle things around here. So, sure. uh, interesting week. Uh, you get some media attention. Um, well, you know, <laughs> obviously we weren't trying to get that attention. What we were trying to do is have a discussion <laughs> among activists, conservative activists, to see um, if there's an alternative to Kelly Ayotte, I think it's generally recognized among conservative activists that there's a great deal of disappointment uh, in her. She's yet another example of someone who is a campaign conservative and then becomes a liberal when she goes to Washington. You know, we can go down the list of issues that are touchstone issues for Republicans. Um, and uh, she gave us assurances um, that her principles would lead to uh, the correct vote on, votes on those issues, and she, she mm. hasn't been there. And, and moreover, her, her votes have been shocking. So, you know, what I had asked is to get together with some groups of activists and see if there's a general understanding of that and a, and a willingness to step up with time and, and financial resources and hopefully a good candidacy to um, provide uh, conservatives in New Hampshire, libertarians in New Hampshire, an alternative. Mm-hmm. So we had a meeting last week, and, and uh, it sure seems there is. Well, I was invited. I didn't have a chance to go, but uh, I I, uh, I know Skip got there, and that was good. Um, good, at least Mike was there. And, 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 and Mike got Mike there, and, and, and got there. the 603 Alliance was represented mm-hmm. there because we have a keen interest in statewide races oh, after the presidential absolutely. primary. Mm-hmm. Sure, and, and what we did learn is there's a way to campaign in New Hampshire. What you do is you send out emails and say secret, confidential, mm-hmm. and, Crazy. and yeah, that way it'll hit all the front pages of exactly of the newspapers, and we'll have uh, the television station outside you with cameras and all that it's uh, it was crazy you know what no nobody said in the email either anything about a secret meeting it was exactly 
We should have phrased. papered over the windows just to drive them crazy. Well, we <laughs> waved. We had everybody turn around, the 60-plus people, just go like this to the guys that were filming out the window. It was quite funny. Yeah, but, you know, I remember back in 2010 when Kelly Ant was first running, and I think, if I remember correctly, Ovin Lamontagne was in the race. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Bill uh, Binney was. And Bill Binney and yep. Jim Bender. Jim Bender. Yep. Jim Bender. Yep. And, and so at one point, Kelly Ant, I was you know, state rep in my third term, I think, at the time, and she called up and said, uh, you know, Bill, will you endorse us? And I said, you know, Kelly, I, I don't think you're conservative. Um, I do think that Ovid is is um, more demonstrably um, conservative on the right issues than, than you are. Um, yeah, you've been an attorney general, and, and we've come to you time and again and asked you to address uh, voter issues, voter fraud issues, and you've not given us the time of day. So I, I don't have great confidence if you go down there, but if you do get the nomination, I'll support you. And ultimately she did, and ultimately I did support her. But I, I didn't support someone who would vote for to bring back crony capitalism in the form of the ex, uh, Export-Import Bank, which mm. she did. I didn't uh, vote for someone who would uh, vote to extend the debt ceiling time and time again without putting any conditions of fiscal responsibility on it. And that's disappointed a lot of us, you know, those type of, of votes. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my first choice was uh, was over, and my second choice would have been Jim Bender, who's a great businessman. Sure. Uh, and, you know, and Bill Binney uh, was tarred with a somewhat liberal brush during that election, but my dealings with him since have shown that he's actually a pretty decent conservative himself. He is. You know, he's, he's been a successful businessman and, and um, built up several businesses, and uh, th- th- therefore he understands, um, I think, uh, what what uh, allows for success in our society. What Kelly Ayotte understands is go become an attorney, get somebody to appoint you as attorney general, and then have a bunch of rich people finance your race <laughs> and, and, and tell the voters you're going to be a conservative when you get down there and then become a more liberal vote than, than look at uh, you know Orrin Hatch and and, uh, and and Senator Graham and, and uh, Senator McCain yeah. if you look at the conservative review scorecard she is among the worst mm-hmm. of Republican senators down there she yeah, signed uh, on with the establishment it was clear but for New Hampshire voters all those things that you talked about and other votes that have been very very bad for small governance and and uh, you know constitutional states s- rights states rights stuff but you know what killed me the worst is look at New Hampshire we're I think we're in the top three, if I'm not mistaken, with energy costs here in this state. I mean, Mm. we're getting killed. It's killing job creation like crazy. And here we have our senator going up there and supporting this latest EPA, you know, bloated clean air yeah, clean, initiative. The clean power what act, the yeah. heck is that? I mean, is there if there is anything that should be concerning New Hampshire, <coughs> her constituency right now, is how much is that going to cost? Well, them? I'm, I'm going to I'm going to point to something else that's related, uh, not just energy. Um, there's a scheme in D.C. I voted for it before I voted against it. Yeah. Only they always tell you they voted against it. And I'm listening to Ted Cruz's book right now when I go on my walks, and it's a good book. And he mentions the uh, absolutely venomous reception he got when he said in a in an organizing meeting about unanimous consent over a debt ceiling bill a couple of years ago, where essentially what what the scheme is is you vote to allow the Democrats to control the outcome, Ugh. and then you can vote against the bill because the Democrats have won, uh, and, and you know and. That was a particularly egregious case, it, which it, only took one vote to stop that happening, and then it makes your vote accountable because you have to be roll called. But uh, wow! But cloture is the same thing. Yeah. You you know, and and you will if you look at Kelly's uh, missives over the past few years, she will tell you frequently she voted for cloture because she believes it deserves debate, uh-huh. and then she can say she voted against the bill which passed, which is what the Democrats wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. it reminds me, in, in, and I think this is something that people have to watch out for, for legislators, because it reminds me of one instance when I was talking to a Senate president in New Hampshire, in which, in trying to convince the Senate president we should uh, support a constitutional amendment to um, uh, make unconstitutional a direct tax on wages and salaries and income tax. And he said, Bill, if we do that, then we've lost a campaign issue. Um, we, we, oh we, get, we, get, we get to tell the people we'll vote against it all the time. 
I said, well, how does that serve the people of New Hampshire? If, because at one of those times, they're going to get a majority vote. We'll have a governor who, who will sign it into law just so you can get elected a few more times and have a, have a campaign issue. Wow. We should, and so I, I, I think I, I agree we do see that among legislators. And to the extent, and Kelly Ayotte has been one of them, we find that happening in Washington. That's a disqualifier for continuing in office. No you, you, you know, that, that particularly says in terms of the – uh, of even the state house. So we talk about citizen legislators. We talk about the pittance that they're paid is a hundred, or if it's two hundred bucks now. Uh, and aside from their special plate on their cars, they really get nothing else. So what is it that would cause a Senate president to want to be reelected over and over and over? There has to be other forms of payback in order to make it worth their while. To, to maneuver like that to actually w- be more worried about their own electability than doing the job it, right. It's access to status and power. power. It's, it's, it's one thing to say you're not getting a salary up there or yeah, you're getting a good salary in, in uh, Washington. And, but it's another thing to say you ha- either have status or you have power or you won't. I've seen up in New Hampshire, where we do get paid $100 a year, people hang on to positions of power um, in desperation because they want to be feel they have the status and the influence yeah. um, and that they're deferred to. The, symbolic of that are the, the license plates. And it, it is kind of sad, but it's not it's, it's sad and it's very dangerous that people would put themselves in those positions just so that they can uh, continue to control the conversation, control people's lives. They enjoy that. Mike. So behind the scenes, you know, during the last Senate run, there were people that were asking me all the time, why do these senators spend, I mean, the guy that I ran against, Booten, ended up spending like $190,000 for the race, right? Mm-hmm. Why would you have people back to that amount, to that amount of money? And it's a good question. If there wasn't some sort of kickback... They kept saying, it can't just be for the license plate. And you know what? I really couldn't answer to it. But logic does tell us it, it has to be more than just the license plate, doesn't well, it? It's the, stat- well, yeah, it's the status and the influence, as Bill said. Okay. A- and you know, why would those backers put that much right. money in? The answer is, like the Clinton Global Graft Initiative, it's what they can buy with it, right. sure. which, is, which is his vote. But the sure. Senate doesn't get anything backdoor. The state senator? Yeah. Uh, well, you, we saw that particular individual get a job paying one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year running the uh, 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 lobbyist group. Uh, after actually, he tried to do it while he was Senate president. Then he tried to continue oh, yeah, in that um, while he was Bragdon. Yeah. yeah, state senator, and then right. ultimately um, he left the Senate and, and continued in, in that job. Right. Look at these positions on the state level can be important. On the federal level, they are very important. Right. When you have a federal budget that is, you know, a trillion dollars and more. Um, clearly, Three and a half trillion some years. Yes. It, clearly you're going to um, uh, have folks who are going to uh, pay to have their candidate win. One of the things, you know, I've, I've talked with folks in Washington about this upcoming race with Kelly Ott, and one of the things I asked them is they, they said, you know, she's, she's probably going to lose um, if she's primaried. Will there be a lot of money that comes into the race for or against her? Well, among the things I've been told is that she's Mitch McConnell's lieutenant. The, a, a Senate majority leader can bring to bear tens of millions of dollars on a race, reach out to the K Street community, um, reach out to the lobbyists, and tell them, this is my lieutenant who is being challenged, and she will have tens of millions of dollars to come into the race. And so... You know, no, no one has stepped up to this point. You know, but right. but if someone does step up, they're going to have to have a lot of activist support right. in order to ground. do it. Right, right. On the right. Ground. But but let's let's look at the other reason. We can say, you know, what Kelly's not being a conservative to us. That's not the issue. There's something else. There's another dynamic at work here. We say that New Hampshire has a weak governorship, and it and it does in in some ways. The gov- the governors can't really propose anything; they can only veto. Uh, and it's been really interesting to me to watch the stepping stone here as the uh, mostly Democrat 
governesses have stepped on sure. to the Senate because the U.S. Senate is more powerful, carries more clout, more status, more money, more kickbacks than anything they can get in the state. And it's going to happen again. And it doesn't matter very much whether she gets primaried. She will lose. She will be replaced by a Democrat if she's not primaried because Hassan has got good base, good support, and the Democrats are absolutely desperate to get some pieces of the Senate back under their control. I, think I agree with you entirely. As I've talked to folks in Washington about her race, um, for example, in the media yesterday, I gave an interview to uh, NBC News, for example, and as I talked to those who are thinking of funding this race one way or the other, I point out the fact that she has lost um, she decided uh, mistakenly to uh, try to make a play for liberal votes that she would think would go to Maggie Hassan, mm-hmm. the Democrat governor who's going to run against her. And as a consequence, she's lost a good portion of her base. It doesn't take much. And we saw what happened in the uh, congressional race with Frank Ginter a couple of cycles back in which a libertarian by the name of Brendan Kelly went in and got you you folks probably remember mm-hmm. better than oh, I yeah. was a five yeah. or six five or six percent he got vote. enough votes to keep him from winning and and that was the amount of votes he received which were clearly votes that would have gone to a Republican candidate exceeded the difference between uh, Congressman Ginter and, and his challenger and that's going to happen with Kelly out if you look uh, at the polls they're within one or two percentage points. she's going to get Scott Brown well more more than, more, more than that, uh, I don't know if I'm able to mention who, but a libertarian group is willing to put up candidates uh, to suck out those few percent to make sure she loses because she's not considered worthy of which, a Which to me would be a, a strategy if there wasn't a, a clear choice that a conservative, a constitutional conservative could make in the primary. But after that, yeah. you know, if there is a choice, that's that's not a good strategy. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's a foregone conclusion that AAT's going to lose. I think the base is going to do exactly what they did two years ago, mm-hmm. uh, it took the last election cycle. They are going to work hard, and the discussions have already started. Yep. There will be a write-in candidate, whether it is a living person or not. There will be a, there will be a choice, and it will be somebody other than Kelly AAT, and the base won't vote for her. I mm-hmm. can tell you that right now. She cannot win this election in this state. So we're going to take a quick break and come back. We can talk about that some more. This is Grok Talk. Stay tuned. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. The topic is Senator Kelly Ayotte's lack of viability as a candidate and what should we do in the conservative base to address the problem. Bill O'Brien is with us to discuss that. Uh, Of course, thank you very much to Jane Cormier for coming in to fill in. Skip has the day off. And Mike Rogers, who is manning the other side of the table. Very important or, job. or at least trying to. At least trying to. Hey, yeah. we got it up by nine. We got everything. The machine. The machine needed a complete rebu- <laughs> reboot. The Ustream wouldn't stop. And so does so, Kelly so, Ayotte. So, uh, <laughs> can I take a few moments? Because you know, oh, yeah. a lot of us who are involved in this understand the context here very well because we've watched Kelly Ayotte with disappointment over the last several years, and and understand why there needs to be an alternative. But I imagine, um, not so much among your listeners, but perhaps among your listeners, but among the the general public, they probably don't, they haven't followed the, the votes. And, and uh, it, w- it would be shocking to them to hear um, how their Republican senator has voted uh, in, in, uh, in Washington. You know, it would be a shock to hear them, uh, uh, for them to hear 
One I mentioned was the XM Bank. 80% of that bank, which which um, ensures exports, go to one company, Boeing. Uh, and it's it's uh, uh, crony capitalism at, at its worst. Um, the exports of planes will take place without the U.S. government <laughs> having to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. To and and, and Boeing that. has made it clear that they will be able to get a- export financing with or without the Exim Bank. They got enough leveraging le- leverage. This they do good enough deals that they're not going to lose their shirts and that people will lend them the money to do the deals. Yeah, and and Jane mentioned another one, the EPA's Clean Power Initiative, which is a culmination of President Obama's uh, policy to get rid of all cold fire electric generating plants in the country. We, we, we do have, um, it goes back and forth, but among the highest top three electric rates in the country in New Hampshire, we would assume our U.S. senator would be concerned about that and try to protect us on the national level. Instead, she's helping President Obama to get rid of coal fired plants. We have 500 coal fired plants in this country. Um, China brings on 500 a year. China and India together bring on 500 a year. Um, by 2030, they will have another, you know, it, it's, it's, it's estimated 10,000 coal-fired plants as we try to get rid of our 500 plants and, 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 and double their, and triple our electric rates. And at their Tell level us. of technology, until it gets to the point where they're killing their citizens with the smog and they're getting close, uh, they're not going to worry about the pollution. They need the energy that badly. Whereas we do worry, we've already scrubbed our coal plants to get rid of the uh, the, the nitric and sulfuric oxides, the, uh, the, the acid rain problem that was 30 years ago. Uh, we've got rid of a lot of the particulates. You can't get rid of the carbon dioxide, and by the way, plants thrive on it. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's a whole different and, and thing. So, and, and but, so, the, the but, whole, uh, the whole co- yeah. intent here is is to fight uh, man-made um, global warming, or whatever they're calling it these days, <laughs> which, which clearly cannot be proven. Um, indeed, if you look at the most stable temperature readings, the satellite readings. Um, temperatures are falling, falling, if anything, worldwide. So uh, they're, they're basically uh, now uh, Senator Ayotte with President Obama uh, trying to triple or d- uh, double or triple electric rates to solve a non-problem. She just voted for a budget that raids the Social Security Fund to the tune of $150 billion. And, uh, and yet the Democrats are always outraged at the thought of actually... Uh, cutting Social Security or even re-engineering Social Security to make it truly viable long term by make, gradually raising retirement ages or, or somehow restructuring it private accounts. They won't let any of that happen. They'll just keep up the pretense that it's going to keep going forever. Meanwhile, they keep stealing the money out of its so-called lockbox. And, and, and the Democrats do it because every Democrat in the Senate voted for it. A majority of Republicans voted against it. And yet Kelly Ayotte joined with a minority of Republicans to get that passed. Mm -hmm. You know, we we all should be very concerned about whether we're keeping our uh, promise to those who are approaching retirement over the next several years. And yet she's going to bankrupt. She's helping bankrupt the system and doing exactly what you talked about, Mike. Keeping up the message that we won't cut any uh, uh, retirement funds, but meanwhile I'm voting to bankrupt the system. Mm -hmm. Um, She's raised spending over the next budget $80 billion dollars violating all of the fiscal guidelines we had put in place to bring down the deficit which would start to do um you know she again campaigned as a conservative she's governing as a, a liberal she has voted for advocated every vote um that has come up to uh, extend the debt ceiling and and, and uh, played the procedural tricks to make sure that we couldn't defund uh, planned parenthood yeah. as well right. it, it, she she absolutely has right. you know when the bill came up and she was asked to sponsor that bill she refused to do it and then did exactly what you said that the final vote which she knew that it would fail she said well, I'm, I'm voting with it I'm voting right. for Right. Now, knowing that McCain in 2008 lost and lost badly, and basically lost badly by trying to appeal to the liberal middle and, and forgetting the, the lesson which is retaught every two years, 
that the Liberals are going to vote for the Democrat no matter what. They are not going to vote for the Conservative. They're not going to vote even for a halfway Conservative. You can do what, and you can appeal to them, and they can pretend to like you, but they're not going to vote for you. And you know, and McCain was the media favorite, and he wouldn't put up a decent fight against Obama, and he lost. So the moment McCain showed up in 2010 race to support Ayotte, I knew we were in trouble. And it hasn't gotten any better since. You know what? You're absolutely right. I, I want to point out the fact that you've just given us four or five talking points that are vastly important for people to know about. But the overreaching thing that people should be aware of was the, the uh, when you said campaign conservative. And why that is important to bring into the discussion is because the reason that we have no true party of conservatism in this country is because all Many, I won't say all, many of the people that then go to Washington, that the campaign to go to Washington, whether you're talking New Hampshire or any other state, mostly, will come out and tell you how they are for smart government. They're they're for small government, fixing the fiscal issue. They will lie to us all the time to get the vote. And then they get in, and we've seen it again and again here in New Hampshire, and they go they go rogue. They go and they go and join the other side. So we, as a, I'm not a part of the Republican Party anymore. I'm an independent. I, 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 I prefer going rogue the way Sarah Palin defines it. Well, there it, you go. Which is sticking true to your principles and not going the way the party we wants you to go. We will never get there though and this until we out point because this behavior. Ayotte, Ayotte is running for the vote and support of the political class, right? Which isn't an actual vote. But it, it, it's money and power and influence, like we talked about, state senators. She's entirely the wrong kind of person to have in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. That power structure, that inside the Beltway mentality, is more important to her than her own state's rights. Right, than her you, own constituents. You, you can't send somebody to Washington that actually cares about being there, and especially not that cares about the perks and privileges of office there, because they will not do the one thing we need them to do, which is to work with the states to reduce the power and devolve the power of the federal right. government back where it belongs. So when I was Speaker of the House, I'd go to Washington quite a bit to try to um, raise money for the re-election of House Republicans. And I noticed something. This would have been 2011, 2012, really kind of at the height of, of the recession that we had. And I'd also, both in my business and for political reasons, be around the country. There was one part of the country that was prosperous during that recession that never had a, a hiccup in its prosperity, and that was Washington. Um, mm. I, and you you would go into that city, and I'm not sure if you were there, Mike. I know you travel a lot in business. I, I, I've, been, you, I've been there. I've been there quite a lot. The, and, disclosure: and you, you see, I can't tell you why. I have been to the DOJ. I've stood in the lobby. I've seen the beaming portraits of Obama and Eric Holder. Uh, trust me, that hurt. Well, <laughs> and, and, and what hurt me was to to go to to. Um, Nashua and Manchester and see uh, uh, closed up storefronts, companies having trouble hiring people and to go down to Washington and see construction cranes all, all over the place. What would hurt me was to go to you know Cincinnati, Ohio, to go to the, the uh, cities like that and, and see that jobs were being lost and storefronts were closed and, and, and the recession had hit hard. We still haven't recovered from it and see that the political class in, in Washington was prospering beyond all in this uh, uh, the, 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 was it the six and counties? The six counties around Washington are the, are the tops amongst the top ten most uh, most most prosperous want, yeah. uh, counties in the entire country. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we used to go to where the business centers were. You know, New York, Boston, Atlanta, San Francisco. That's where the prosperity was. Now, as you pointed out, prosperity, the highest incomes um, in the country are found in the federal employee-dominated counties around Washington. And, and yet Washington still is a hellhole in lots of ways. There's yeah. places in Washington I wouldn't want to be, uh, and it's the capital city. We've got well, about a minute. That's because it's Democrat. One government. minute. Yeah, yeah you're, 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 abs- you're absolutely right. So where are we going with this? I mean, uh, how's it look? Uh, so the, the, the uh, bottom, people are talking. and um, the, the bottom line is that Kelly will lose the general because even if People of good intent come out and vote for her because she's better than a Democrat, barely. She doesn't have the enthusiasm. She won't have the base. The liberals that she may have pleased uh, during the six years will not vote for her. They'll vote for Hassan, and she will lose. It's as simple as that. She's not rescuable at this time. I would would much rather talk about 
an alternative than how she's going to lose it because you know what folks need to have some sense of hope in this race yeah and, and, the, and the hope is that we find a good conservative and we rally enough people Absolutely. enough money behind that conservative and you know the the remarkable thing about that meeting this week is that is that the egos that were not in the room people want a good conservative and they don't care whether it's themselves mm-hmm. so where we go steve is is to the voters of new hampshire to those who would pour money uh, from outside the state into Kelly Ayotte's race, race or an alternative, we have to um, convince them that New Hampshire is not a purple state. It is a state that will respond well to um, constitutional Republican arguments, which I call traditional American mm-hmm. values. Kelly Ayotte is going to lose. Um, she clearly will lose. When when um, Republican voters in New Hampshire understand that, when, when all of Mitch McConnell's K Street buddies understand that, then we're going to have a chance to get a good constitutional right. Republican in that position. All right, that's it for this week's show. I want to thank you for coming in and spending some time with us. And this is Grok Talk. We'll be back next week with more news, more conversation, and more Grok Talk. See ya. <laughs> The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of CNHT, GranitGrock.com, this station, or anyone else for that matter.